Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! Hi! Oh my god, I'm so tired. I even messed up with the stream. I, I began with the stream with my face. I hope it didn't show too much. And I will cut it on the YouTube recording. Uh, coding is stressful and you can see it from my eye bags. But it's also pretty rewarding. So uh, it, it's kind of a, a problem solving challenge. Every day you have to solve problems and you have to solve them uh, pretty quickly uh, before some deadline. But uh, it's so rewarding. And of course, if you don't do it for the reward, you can do it for the money. Well, through coding, I, I was able to feed myself and also to... Um, well, to buy myself stuff. For example, I bought myself a Lamborghini. I don't know how many people can afford a Lamborghini, but I could. And uh, it was not even that expensive. It was quite cheap. I don't know, something like uh, 15, 20 euros. I love it. Look at that. It's even opening its uh, doors. Beautiful. So, if you want to afford a Lamborghini like I do, just do coding because it's fun. It's... In, it's uh, it's nice, it's a challenge, and it's also uh, going to bring you money. Let's go to today's lessons. Today's lessons are two, actually. <laughs> code quality, we will finish the topic on code quality, and then we'll go on to looking at JavaScript objects, if you have nothing to object, of course. Good morning, Angelo. Hi, so nice to see you. <laughs> okay, so let's go. JavaScript code quality, we already saw how to debug in Chrome, we already said something about coding style, and we even installed Prettier as a code for matter, so we don't need to uh, argue on tabs versus spaces, or even beat up people who prefer both instead of just tabs and spaces. Uh, we already mentioned some things about clean code and comments. Um, there is one line of philosophy that says that uh, comments can be even... Uh, optional if you write your code as clean as possible and you also write tests for your code. Some people say that good code is well commented code. I'm not going to, 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 to go through this debate. Uh, you will decide by yourselves or you will have your team to decide what is best, having or not having comments in your code. And then there was also uh, another cool page here. So, good morning, I had a good laugh with the Lamborghini. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the feedback. <laughs> I, I felt pretty stupid about that, but uh, I, I'm happy that the message went through. Uh, so, um, there is this page about Ninja Code, and um, I really, really encourage you to read it. If you haven't read it, I'm not going to waste your time today, but maybe next next practice, next Wednesday, we could uh, probably have a look at it together because it says, in a very ironic way, things that you're not supposed to do as if you were supposed to do them. For example, make the code as short as possible. You have to read this as the opposite. Don't make the, short, uh, the code as short as possible because there's no need to do that and your code will become cryptic and nobody will be able to read it, not even yourself. So there's many... Good morning, team. Hi, Tiago. So nice to see you. Long time, actually. You weren't very active, you guys. What, are, what were you up to recently? No, just joking. You, you tell me only if you want to. Um, so, we're not going to go through the Ninja Code parts, uh, but I wanted you to finish this topic on code quality by installing not only Prettier, but also ESLint as an extension to Visual Studio Code. The problem with ESLint is that ESLint will not work out of the box unless something changed in the meantime. So, we'll try to fix this problem. Why will it not work out of the box? So, let's go to Visual Studio Code and let's go to and let's click on this um, button here, which is the extensions. And I can look for ESLint. So ES stands for ECMAScript, which is the standard that we are using right now. JavaScript is an implementation of the ECMAScript standard. And Lint, well, Lint is a strange word. Um, linting is I, so lint is a piece of uh, wool or is, wait a second ah uh, i cannot i cannot search things on the internet properly too tired 
Okay, this is lint, but we are not talking about this kind of lint, okay? We're talking about linting, and linting in software is something like this. A linter is a static code analysis tool used to flag programming errors, bugs, stylistic errors, and suspicious constructs. The term originates from a Unix utility that examines C language source code. So, JavaScript is not a compiled language, it's an interpreted language, as you know. Uh, a compiled language gets translated into some other language, and in the process, if there are any errors or potential problems, those are spotted. But JavaScript is not compiled, so there's no such uh, check for errors and problems. That's why we are going to add another piece of uh, software called a linter, which even if JavaScript is not compiled, will still try to check for potential problems and errors. Tiago, sorry, I'm watching the lessons, but not always I'm live. Thanks for your concern. Oh, okay, okay. Um, that's, um, that's good, that's good. No worries about that. If you have any problems with the material, if you have any problems with the exercises, don't worry, you can always ask me any time. There are people who are interacting with me quite a lot in Discord, and I encourage you to do exactly the same. Um, don't worry also if you are struggling doing the uh, exercises on functions, because the tasks on the tutorial are pretty easy and I'm pretty sure that you can do them. But the exercises, the homework that I give to you, well, they are tough challenges and uh, don't worry if you're not able to do them because they are supposed to be quite tough. So, really, just uh, keep it chill. <laughs> Don't, don't despair too much. Okay, so we're going to install this linter, ESLint. So in Visual Studio Code, you look for ESLint, and the first result should be this one, which is also flagged with a star, because probably it's one of uh, Visual Studio's favorites. No, this extension is enabled globally. Okay, so if I click on it, you will have a button called Install. I don't, because I have it installed already. And that's it. But with Pritya, that was exactly what we needed. With ESLint, we have to do something more, because the Prettier extension for Visual Studio Code already ships its own Prettier executable inside, so uh, it will just work out of the box. But ESLint doesn't ship its own ESLint executable out of the box, and we have to install it manually. And this is exactly what it says here. This extension uses the ESLint library, which should be installed in the open workspace folder. In the if the folder doesn't provide one, the extension looks for a global install version, so you should still have something globally installed. And if you haven't installed ESLint, either locally or globally, do so by running npm install ESLint in the workspace folder or for a local install, or npm install minus g ESLint for a global install. On new folders, you might also need to create blah, 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 blah. And I think that this uh, documentation is not what we want. I'll guide you through this ESLint installation in another way. So please install the extension and then we are ready to install ESLint as a dependency of our project. You should have the your portfolio open in the workspace as always and you should also be able to open the terminal and uh, I'm opening the terminal from within Visual Studio Code because it's uh, it's much more convenient. So I'm just right clicking on the name of my works of my project and saying open an integrated terminal if you have problems with that you can open the terminal and cd into your directory do exactly what what you need to do so eslint is one of those packages that you install from this source here npm js npm means many things. In fact, if you look at here, it stands for nitro-powered motorcycles. But if you refresh the browser, it will tell you something completely different. Neuron-powered motorization, or again, noble pug mullet, okay? So, NPM stands for Node Package Manager. So, we already know what Node is. It's the JavaScript runtime for the terminal. And uh, the Node Package Manager is Another software that we have already installed when we installed Node.js, it is an npm executable, and it allows you to install, de uninstall uh, packages, dependencies, libraries that you can use in your project. 
So you don't need to write all the code by yourself. You can rely on some libraries that were already made for you. And one of these libraries is called ESLint. NPM does more than that, actually. NPM does a lot of things like uh, executing scripts. But this is what we are going to install, ESLint. The problem with node packages is that they can be installed only on node projects. And what we have here in Visual Studio Code is not a node project. This is just a folder. It's also a Git repository because we've got the hidden .git folder, but it's not a node project. And we have to initialize this folder as an, an NPM project and a node project. And we do it like this on the terminal. We have to be in the folder of the portfolio, not in one of those subfolders. We have to be in the main folder. Okay. And we type this command npm in it. npm is a command that should be already available since you already installed Node.js. Node.js goes with the command node, which we used a lot, and also with the command npm. npm accepts one argument, which is in it, which will initialize our npm package. So hopefully everything is fine. I'll go npm init, press enter, go. Okay, now uh, it starts asking questions. So I'm going to expand the terminal so it's, uh, it looks uh, well uh, better. And uh, now it's going to ask questions and I'm going to practically say yes to anything. Anyway, what is the package name? By default, it will be exactly the same name as this current folder. And I will say, that's it. The default is fine for me, so I can just press enter and we'll take the default value. If, for any reasons, your folder has capital letters, this could give you uh, an error. So if your uh, in Inglorious Portfolio folder is Inglorious with a capital I, well, in NPM, we don't like capital letters. And the reason is that the package names become parts of the URL so there is this convention in node packages that everything should be lowercase and possibly in kebab case just like this inglorious portfolio name that i that i used so as you you see how important is this convention kebab case camel case pascal case that's why i uh, i was stressing so much on this okay so package name for me, it's exactly the same, but if it's not the same for you, you, ha you can do something like, uh, uh, I don't know, amazing dash project, and then you press enter. So you give another name, but I'm not going to be given a name. So I'm just going to press enter. That's it. What's the version of this package? What's the version of my project? Um, I'm not going to, uh, too deep with this, but uh, version 100 means the first stable version, the first version that I could ship to the world. If I think that this version is still not ready to be uh, shipped to the world, and it's just my first private attempt, I usually use another naming convention, which is um, another number, which is 0.1.0. .0. Uh, there is a reason for these numbers, um, and uh, the reason is called semantic versioning. Oops, semantic versioning, or semver for short. Semantic versioning is a convention that is widely used nowadays, and it's uh, used by NPM, in which you have three numbers to identify the version of a package. The first number is the major release. So when you upgrade a package from one to two, you should expect some major changes, which could also break backward compatibility what we, with what you had before. So usually changing from one major to another major, from version one to version two, it usually changes quite a lot. And uh, a library that you are upgrading will probably break your code unless until you you upgrade your code so it uses the new version of your library uh, the second number is the minor so uh, when this number increases 
It means that uh, you added some new features to your library, to your package, but they are not breaking any, any, any existing software. So you're just adding new features. And the third one, the third uh, number is the patch number. Because sometimes you add new features, but you make mistakes, you add bugs. And when you fix a bug, you increase this kind of number. So you add a new feature to 010, it becomes 020. Oh, you introduced a bug, you fix it, and this becomes 0.2.1, because it's 0.2, but with the bug that was fixed. You find another bug, you fix it, 0.2.2. Uh, you add a new feature, 0.3.0. Uh, you, you rewrite your library completely from scratch, it becomes 1.0.0, okay? So, um, I'm using 0 0.1.0 .0 just, just for fun. Uh, I could just keep it like that. I, uh, it's just to explain you things. So, version 0.1.0, .0. enter. Description. All this stuff uh, will create a file that I can edit later on. So, I'm not even supposed to do everything right now. I can just skip everything and then refine the generated file later on. And I will show you, of course, the generated file. But anyway, um, I will say portfolio project uh, created during, ah, during the Inglorious Academy 2021 or yeah let's say 2020 2021 because we spanned two years okay so anything you want and you can you're still able to change it afterwards so don't don't sweat it too much go entry point we don't really care about this entry point um so i'm just going to go with enter and uh, let's just keep it uh, i i there's no need to, to explain anything about, about this right now. Test command. No test command. Let's go. Enter. So to recap, both entry point and test command, I just press enter because I don't care what they mean. Git repository. By default, it's pointing exactly to the Git repository where I'm storing all this stuff. So uh, this command already... Uh, understood that I that this project is synchronized in Git and it's asking me, hey, is this the proper Git repository that you're using? Yes, it is. Okay, so enter. Keywords. So keywords are not important in this case. They are important if you want to publish your projects to NPM because keywords are the way you are able to search for packages. For example, let's say I don't know, uppercase, will it, you, will it give me anything? Uppercase, there is a project called uppercase, which is an exact match, but there's also constant case because the, uh, the author of this package, Blake Embry, added uppercase as a keyword. So this package was uh, retrievable through this keyword, okay? So you can write any keyword you want here, especially if you intend to publish your package to NPM, which is not our case, so I'll leave it blank. Press enter, go. Author, me. <laughs> okay, the author could be... A, um, there is a syntax for, the, for this author, and uh, you, can, you can just write anything you want. But if you want an author that is recognized in NPM, this is just out of curiosity, you can... Put your name, and my whole name is Matteo Anthony Mistretta. Look for me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, connect to me and connect with me. I love uh, get to know you in real life and uh, have a face associated to the numbers that I see on Twitch. And uh, then I can put my email between less than and greater than uh, symbols, just like they were brackets. And my email is not private. In fact, you will find my email anywhere in the internet, so I don't care. You can spam me, that's fine. How do I get the NPM to work, says Katri. Ooh, okay. Um, you should have Node.js installed already, I hope so. Node.js. Hi, Katri. so you're, you're watching live. Awesome. Nice to see you here live with us. So you should have installed Node.js already, starting from lesson zero or one. 
um, if you have it installed, when, whenever you open a terminal, you should be able to do something like uh, node-v, which will tell you the version that you have installed of node. Think I installed but didn't get the open in terminal bit. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, if you have node installed, you can then open a terminal, any terminal. I actually opened the terminal inside of Visual Studio Code by doing this. Uh, I'm looking at the project folder, right click, open an integrated terminal, because this will open the integrated terminal inside of Visual Studio Code, starting from the current folder. Yes, I do. Okay, so see if this works. You should open the terminal, but there is only drop down node and JavaScript debug. Mm, no, not really sure what's why. <laughs> drop down node and JavaScript. Okay, I don't think you are in the right place. Maybe you are here. Or I, I don't know. Did you press F5 for some reason? Uh, okay. Let's make sure that you are in the Explorer section, so you see the Untitled Workspace or whatever, and you see all your files and folders here. I hope so. If you have all these files and folders and you right-click on the Project folder, you should see many more things, not the drop-down node and JavaScript debug. Let's see if you're able to. If you have any problems, um, maybe you can send me, send us, because we are here with you. Uh, you can send us screenshots on the Discord channel. I think you are already here, right? Let's see. Yeah, I see Katri here. So, Katri, if you want, if you still need some, uh, some more help on this, you can have a look on the Discord and, uh, and add any any screenshot that can help us help you. Let's go on, because don't worry, Katri, you're not missing anything really important. So we were in the process of uh, uh, creating our first NPM project. We are doing NPM init and we are now answering to some questions. We were at the author question. So the author can be anything you want. You can write any string, but there is a special format if you want, which is your name, your email address in these angular brackets, just like a tag. And then in parentheses, you can add your website. I'm going to put uh, ingloriouscoders.it. Pay a visit to ingloriouscoders.it if you want. Uh, I made it shiny and uh, and SVG and 3D like. There's the you can play around with my logo. Okay, that's it. I'm going to press enter. License. I don't care about the license. This is fine. Uh, sometimes uh, for open source project we use MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of, Te of Technology license, which is an open source license that allow. Any, that allows anyone to do pretty much everything, but uh, the right-click menu is weird. Okay, could you please send me a screenshot of that? I don't know what, uh, what's happening. Uh, if you send me a screenshot, I will be able to get your problem in a, in, in, on the spot. Um, I'm going to use MIT as license, okay? And now it says, I'm about to write to this file here called package.json, this content here. And it asks, does this look okay? Yes, it does look okay. So I'm just going to press enter and that's it. I sent a screenshot and don't know how to get to where you are now. Okay, this is the screenshot. Okay, I see, I see the problem. No worries, no worries about that. So the problem with your um, Wait a second, I'm, I'm looking at the terminal. Package name npm install. Sorry, you can now contain all friend characters. Version 100. Hmm. Okay, so one of the problems that we have here is that you have only one project in, uh, open on your workspace. So the name of the project is not here as a folder, but it's here 
instead of untitled workspace. So when you right click, you see the menu like I see it when I click on here. So this is already a, 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 a small problem, but uh, don't worry about this. We can, we can do it like this. You can right click instead on one of the folders that you have, for example, 00, zero introduction, and you open this in the integrated terminal. This, you should be able to do it. Any folder, any top level folder that you have there, you right click and you open an integrated terminal. This will open your integrated terminal, which looks something like this, maybe slightly different, but very similar. And once you are in this situation, watch out. You're not, you, you don't need to issue any commands yet because you're not in the proper folder. You have to go back one folder to get to the parent folder, to the Inglorious Portfolio folder, or in your case, Inglorious Portfolio. <laughs> okay, so you just do cd dot dot, which we learned on lesson number two, probably one or two. No, probably two. cd dot dot, cd space dot dot, will lead you from the zero zero introduction folder to the parent folder. So after the cd space dot dot, enter, you should see yourself located in the Inglorious Portfolio folder. And from there, I think we are, we are good because I see that your terminal says something like use npm install package afterwards to install a package, blah, blah, blah. So it looks like you have npm installed and you can use it inside of this folder. So once you open the terminal and went back one folder and you're located in the glorious portfolio folder, now you will be able to do npm space in it. I will run through this again because maybe some of you lost some information. So I'm running through this again. npm in it. And now it's going to start asking me questions. What is the package name? In Glorious Portfolio is the default. It's fine for me. I press enter. Version is 100. That's fine for me. If you want to change it, then type anything you want. For example, 0 0.100. Otherwise, you just press enter and it will take the default version. Description. You write the description. Blah, 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 blah. Enter. Entry point. We don't care about this. Enter. Test command. We don't care about that. Enter. Git repository, the default one is the correct one, so we don't need to change it, press enter. Keywords, we don't care about keywords because we're not going to ship this project anytime soon in the NPM uh, repository and in the NPM registry, but if you need to, to add any keywords, I think they should be comma separated, not really sure, so like my awesome project. I don't know if, yeah, probably they are comma, they should be comma separated. But we are not going to give, to send any keywords, so enter. Author, me, myself, and I. Or you can use your name, your real name. I used my real name, Matteo Anthony Mistretta. And then you can add, like a tag, angular brackets in which you, you place your email. And then, separate by a space, you can put even your website, your, uh, your portfolio, in uh, parentheses. Something like this. You have your portfolio on Netlify, so maybe you can add that website. License. You can, you can keep it like that, ISC, or you can do MIT. Or there are other licenses there, the GPL, the Apache, or your personal commercial license if you want to. But let's uh, go with ISC or MIT, that's fine. Uh, it must be a valid license. You cannot say my personal license, it, it will not work, as far as I know. And now it says, is this okay? Is this JSON file okay? What do I know? Let's say it's okay. So we press enter for yes. Or if it's not okay, I will say no, and the operation was aborted, nothing happened. 
I did this because I was already doing this uh, this uh, form in another place, so I'm going to say yes in here because I spent some time to create a, a proper description. So in this case, yes, it is okay, and you can say yes, or you can just press enter. Katri, are you with us? Did you catch up? Let's see if uh, Katri is uh, trying to contact us in any other way, you know. Hopefully this is working. So let's press enter. And that's it. What happened? Well, the only thing that happened is that we have a new file in our root. Thank you! Awesome, Katri! Lovely. Um, okay, so we've got this package.json file at the root of the project. And if I click on it, I will see this thing here, <laughs> which I don't really care what it means, but it has everything that we already said. The name of the project is Inglourious Portfolio, the version is 010, the description is whatever we pl placed, and we can change things. If I want to go back to 100, I can just change this string here. Um, then the main, which we don't care, there's the script test, which we don't care, there's the repository, the author that I... Uh, that I wrote carefully, the license, MIT, for bugs, just go here, and the home page is this one here. We don't care about the, the, all these things. But now we've got a package.json, which means that automatically, oh, we've got also the license, but I think the license was already here. Not really sure. Yeah, probably the license was already here, and it's an, an, an MIT license. Okay, so... Um, now that we have the package.json, this folder is not just a folder. It was already a Git repository, but now it's also an NPM project. It's a node project, node package. And now we are able to install things on, with NPM. So, still again in the terminal. I'm on the terminal, I'm going to clear everything. I'm on the terminal, in this folder, and now I'm going to issue another command. The command is npm install eslint. Watch out, I'm not pressing enter yet. Another thing that I can do is add a flag called dash dash save, which is probably optional nowadays, but I don't want to risk it. You know what, I'm not going to use it, and then if I really need it, I will add it, okay? Things change some, sometimes, and I, I actually don't remember every single thing, and I just try things out, and if they work, that's, that's fine. That's my new information. npm install eslint will uh, grab eslint from the npm registry and will install it locally on our computer. npm install eslint. All lowercase, all attached, no dashes. Let's go. Enter. It's doing a lot of stuff and now it's finished. And now we've got two new resources on our, on our project folder. One is called package-lock.json, which is different from package.json. Package-lock is a huge JSON. And the good news is that we don't need to understand it and we don't even need to read it. Uh, we have to keep it like that. This is a file that locks the version of packages. So it just uh, makes sure that the versions of the packages that we installed are kept the same. Or you can track the changes on the versions of those packages. So it's something quite uh, advanced and we don't need it. But another thing that we need is the folder called node modules, as you see here. Node modules is a folder that is a little grayed out in my, in my editor. And it's grayed out because by default, this folder is not synchronized with Git. So it is in the Git ignore. If I open the Git ignore, probably somewhere I will see node modules. Here it is. You see? So. The node modules is not synchronized with the repository, and for a good reason, because if you open it, it's huge. What? We installed just eslint, but 
Instead, we actually installed a lot of other stuff that we didn't even know. And that's what, because our project now depends on ESLint. But ESLint was created as a JavaScript project, as we are, re are doing right now. And ESLint depends on some other libraries, on some other packages. And those packages depend on some other packages. So just installing one package, ESLint, will actually bring in so many other packages. And that's one of the reasons why, um, why JavaScript is actually mocked by other communities or the JavaScript community itself. This is one meme that I love. The heaviest objects in the universe. The sun, which curves the space-time continuum by a lot. The neutral star, the neutral star, which is much heavier. The black hole is probably the heaviest, but there's nothing heavier than the node modules folder. Okay, so now we install the node modules folder and we have many things inside. We don't even care. The only thing that we care probably is, well, ESLint. We've got a folder called ESLint. So this is where we have ESLint. We also see other things like, uh, uh, probably I already mentioned Lodash sometime. So ESLint apparently depends directly or indirectly um, from Lodash. And, um, and Node Models also has another folder called bin. And the bin is not the trash bin. The bin is the folder that contains all binary executable files. And in those executable files, you see ESLint. So this is the executable that the Visual Studio Code extension of ESLint will look for in order to perform linting. I hope it's clear. No worries about that. Uh, this is just information. But now we have to use this ESLint. We don't care how, what, what is the rationale behind. We want to use it. So before using ESLint, we have to initialize this project not only as an NPM package, but also as an ESLint package. So we also have to do now ESLint, which should be available now. But if it's not available, you know what? Let's do something even more fail safe. We do NPX ESLint npx is another command that was shipped with node and npm npx is a new command that executes commands from npm so npx does a cool thing if you have eslint uh, locally installed it should probably use the locally installed version of eslint but if you don't have eslint installed on your computer then it will grab eslint from npm save a copy to your computer, cache it, execute it, and then keep the cache there in case you need it again. So NPX is the most fail-safe thing that we can do because either you have ESLint installed or not, it will just work. And now NPX space ESLint, I'm going to reopen the terminal so you can see better. Uh, NPX space ESLint space dash dash init. It is similar to the NPM init that we did before, but npm init was without the dashes. Here the dashes are really important. Every package has its own syntax. They try to merge the syntaxes sometimes, they try to standardize these syntaxes, but sometimes they fail to do so. So we just have to remember these syntaxes or we can just go on the internet. So remember, all these things that I'm showing you are things that I remember by heart because I, I, I use them not daily, but I use them sometimes, seldom, and uh, I have a good memory for this kind of stuff. But you're not supposed to know everything by heart. You're supposed to know how to look on the internet. So ESLint initialize project or something like that, and you will probably find a piece of documentation. The documentation that I found is exactly what you find in the official ESLint website. So another thing you can do is look for ESLint, you click on ESLint, you'd go to user guide, getting started, and you stumble upon exactly the same thing. And as you can see, they say, you should install npm install ESLint with, the, with this other flag, dash dash save dev, 
or you can use another package manager called yarn which we don't really care about right now and then oh look at that they also suggest to use npx eslint instead of just eslint awesome by the way uh, i told you that i was uh, not sure if i wanted to use this flag here the reason is that when you install packages like this Sometimes they do not appear then in the package JSON, but now it does appear. When I installed ESLint with npm install ESLint, now we have a new section in this package.json which lists the dependencies. And the dependency is ESLint version, as you can see, we're using the semantic versioning 7.20.0. So the major version is 7. The minor version is 20, and there were no bug fixes since version 20. It was probably perfect, or maybe they haven't spotted any bug, or they're working on some patches right now. And uh, this symbol says that I need ESLint version at least 7.20.0, but it's okay if you give me 7.21 or 7.20.1. It's not okay if you give me ESLint, dot, um, ESLint version 8 because that would be a breaking change. It would probably make my code explode somehow. So uh, this caret is um, another convention that tells me what kind of compatibility I want uh, from this package. It's version 7 dot anything. Uh, this caret keeps the 7 uh, in place and the rest of the numbers can change. Uh, when you install things with uh, this other flag, dash dash save dash dev, the only thing that changes is that ESLint will be saved not inside of the dependencies, but inside of the dev dependencies, which makes not much sense nowadays for some reasons, but in earlier days it was meaningful to save dependencies of the projects in in a place and dependencies for the development of my project in a separate place uh, you can change it you can keep it as dependencies that's fine note the camel case however if you want to change it write it in camel case dev dependencies with a capital d in in the middle okay so Let's go back to initializing ESLint. So npx ESLint dash dash init. I'm going to go enter. And now still questions. Okay, let's answer these questions. Hey, Danilo C. Sousa. <laughs> Love, nice to see you uh, following us. So how do, would you like to use ESLint? And here I can go up and down with my arrow keys to select the option and then I can press enter. So the first option is to check syntax only. The second one is to check syntax and also find potential problems, which I'll tell you, it's pretty, pretty interesting and pretty useful. The third option is to check syntax, find problems and also enforce code style. This is not that useful anymore because to enforce code style we now have another tool which is Prettier, which we already installed. So we don't care about this third option anymore and probably it's even discouraged to use ESLint nowadays to enforce code style. Don't use it for, to enforce code style. Just check the syntax and find problems. So I'm moving to this second option and pressing enter. What type of modules does your project use? JavaScript modules, import export, common JS, require exports, or none of these? Well, for now, none of these, because we don't even know what a module is. So let's just not care about it and do with no, none of these. I'm going, go. Which framework does your project use? Does it use React? Does it view, use Vue or none of these? Um, Strangely enough, there are other frameworks out there, <laughs> but they are focusing on the, well, the best ones, actually. The React from Facebook uh, is the, my favorite framework, and Vue.js is also a very, very good framework, uh, which is not backed by any company, I think. Um, but we're not using React or Vue.js, at least for now, so we're going to go with none of these. And let's press Enter. Does your project use TypeScript? 
Uh, you can select up and down, right and left, and I would say no, we're not going to use TypeScript. Some people out there really love TypeScript. I don't. Uh, you will decide if you love it or not. Love it or leave it, I'm not going to use it in the Inglorious Academy, at least for now. So, no. Where does your code run? Is it on the browser or is it on Node or is it on both? Because now you can choose both. If you want to select or deselect one of these, you have to press space instead of enter. So if I want to also enable Node, I'm going to press space on Node and now it's selected. And once I, uh, once I selected everything that I wanted, and I'm going to select both because we are actually using uh, this code both on the browser and also on Node.js. So why not? Let's, uh, let's open our possibilities. And then when I, once I selected both, I can press enter. What format do you want your config file to be in? The configuration file that will be created can be created in uh, three different formats. One is JavaScript, just like a JavaScript file, YAML or JSON. What is the difference? Well, JavaScript uh, is a JavaScript file and you can use variables, you can use functions. It's a, it's a plain JavaScript file. You can perform calculations in this JavaScript file if you want your configuration to be dependent on something. So this is probably the, the most uh, customizable way of writing this configuration, but I wouldn't suggest it right now. JSON is a very important and standard format, and it's the format in which the, already the package JSON is uh, described. This is JSON format. The problem I see with JSON is that it is a little verbose because you have to, uh, to wrap every single key and value in here with, uh, with double quotes. If they are single quotes, it doesn't work. If they are backticks, it doesn't work. So you have to be as strict as possible. You have to place a comma every, for every single key value pair that you see here. And the last element should never have a comma, otherwise it won't work. So JSON is way too strict for my taste. And I prefer another format, which we already started using for Prettier, which is the YAML. In YAML, you can even add uh, comments, which is not possible in JSON. And in YAML, this thing is much easier than writing this thing here. Right? So in YAML, everything is simpler and you can add, com you can add comments. And this makes it a perfect fit if you want to write configuration files. So you know what? I'm going to use YAML, okay? I'm going to hover through YAML and then press enter. Let's go. Successfully created .eslintrc.yaml file in this folder here. Here it is, .eslintrc.yaml. And you can see there's already stuff in here. But this stuff is just a recap of what we already said. The environment is the browser, but it's also ES 2021, so we are using the bleeding edge features of JavaScript, and the environment is also Node. This will allow ESLint to understand that if you write alert, that's a global variable provided by the browser. If you don't, uh, if you remove browser, then it will probably uh, uh, complain that alert was never defined before. Angelo, I got kind of an error message here. Okay, let's look at it. Uh, could you send a screenshot? Oh, you did. <laughs> Sorry. Um, local ESLint installation not found. Uh, the config that you've selected requires the following dependencies. ESLint latest. Okay, so it looks like the previous command didn't work. So I would ask you to issue again, before doing this, the command npm install ESLint. And if you want to get fancy, you can also use this other flag, dash dash save dash dev. Same for me, I pressed yes. So you have problems with the local installation of ESLint. Oh, same for me, I pressed yes and worked. Oh, okay, so you guys are having this problem here, local ESLint not found, 
but then you do yes and it still works okay um, however it would be nice to have a look oh, you know what it, it is possible that this command uh, was so stupid to not find this uh, executable ESLint here it's found it on my computer because in my computer I have some settings that are slightly different from yours because I use it for work every day uh, but you shouldn't be worrying too much probably how do you go back on a question earlier I just selected browser? Um, as far as I know, you cannot go back to an earlier question. You have to redo everything by yourself. But don't worry, you can do another thing. Because everything you do is not engraved in stone and you can change it afterwards. So if your ESLint RC file, if the uh, generated file doesn't look like this, but it looks like, uh, I don't know, for example, like this, because you don't have browser true, you can still add it. You can add it manually. So look at your ESLintRC YAML, and if it doesn't look exactly like this, you can still change it. I'm going to type tab, tab browser, semi, uh, column, true, and that's it. So should I click yes like Tiago or no and then do what you proposed? No, click yes, click yes. That's fine. Uh, if Tiago says that he had the same error, I pressed yes and everything worked, then let's just ignore that thing. Okay, so let's not go back to questions. The end result will be this. In fact, if you don't want to be asked questions, you can just, uh, and if you already have this .eslintrc YAML in this project, uh, whenever you create a new project, you can just copy this configuration file in your project and you're good to go. In fact, I usually do it like this because I have some uh, personalized configurations that I want to keep from project to project. So I just copy my personal configuration just the way I, uh, I like it and just paste it on the new project. So I'm... Uh, Spending some time allowing you to make sure that you have exactly this configuration. Watch out, because as you can see, this configuration has some tabbed things. You see? Some indentation. This indentation is as important as ever. In JavaScript, indentation is important to ensure readability of your code. But in YAML, just like in other languages such as Python or Ruby, indentation is part of the syntax. If you indent this browser line, it means that this browser line is somehow a child of this env thing here. So it is really, really important to add this indentation because if you remove it, then browser is not a child of env anymore. And it must be, otherwise this configuration will never work. Everything's fine. So if I read this file, it says the environment is the browser, but also Node.js and also ECMAScript 2021. Thanks, Tiago. Worked. I love how the community helps each other. Awesome. And uh, now we got another thing here in the configuration, which uh, says that ESLint is a set of rules and we are going to customize some of these rules. But by default, we are just extending the recommended rules by ESLint. So we already have a set of rules. You see here, rules is an empty thing. And uh, it's not really empty. It's using all the rules that are already provided by ESLint, all the recommended ones. And in the rules section, we can add even more rules if we want. Or we, we can override some of the rules that we uh, already have from ESLint. Now that we have all this stuff, our code, which looked perfect in our eyes, will start to be less perfect. Because ESLint, if it's working properly, it's going into action and it's going to complain about some problems in our code. For example, I open this file and I see a problem. You see this true is um, uh, underlined with a reddish underline. And if I hover on the true, it says unexpected constant condition. ESLint, no constant condition. So ESLint is telling me that although this code works, 
but it ha it has a potential problem. It is strange that you are having an if with the true inside. If true, well, this condition will always be true. So why should you do if true, then do this? You can just remove the if. Or maybe the condition should not be just true. Uh, it should be something that can become true or false. Okay? So this is ESLint that's giving me an error. And I have to fix this error. Otherwise, ESLint is still going to complain. Uh, I'm going to say... Let, let's try to trick it and say const condition is equal to true. And then I'm going to use the condition here. Okay, I tricked ESLint. I tricked ESLint by just moving that uh, Boolean condition into its own constant and then use this constant here. So as you can see, ESLint is not able to spot everything. I can still trick it and uh, leave the potential problem there. Let's find another example. Uh, I'm going to open uh, this one. Functions reprise. And in here, I see that hovering on first try, it says, hey, first try was defined as a function, but was never used. In fact, I commented out the the place, the line in which I'm using this function. This is another rule called no unused vars. And the cool thing about ESLint is that if you don't really understand the reason why this is an error, you can still click on the name of the rule and uh, allowing Visual Studio Code to open this external website, it will go to a page in the ESLint documentation which will explain you thoroughly what this rule is about. In the ESLint recommended rule set, apparently it is an error to declare a variable and never use it. Because if you leave a dangling variable somewhere, uh, maybe it could be reused by someone else and in an improper way. So just declare variables if you really intend to use them. Otherwise, just remove those variables because you probably don't need them. And this is the problem that we have here. Here we declared not a variable, a function, but we are not using it. If I want to remove this error, either I'm using this function, so invoking it somehow, or I can just, I don't know, comment out this function or remove it completely, delete it from, the, from my code base. Maybe this was an old function that is not uh, worth keeping anymore. So ESLint is allowing me to keep my code clean because it allows me to spot whether I have some dangling variables and functions that I don't use anymore. Uh, sometimes I prefer not to see this as an error because it's not an error. It's not going to break my code. It's a potential flaw, but I don't want to be uh, uh, informed as if it was an error. I prefer to be warned as if it was a potential error, but not a blocking one. So in ESLint, you've got three levels. You can uh, give an error if some rule is not met. You can send a warning, and you will see this thing uh, underlined in yellow instead of in red. And you can completely ignore that rule because you don't care about that rule. You don't want to be warned in any way about the rule being violated. Okay? So. I want to change the level of this error. I don't want to see it as an error, I want to see it as a warning. The only thing that I need to do here is to remember the name of the rule. The rule is called no unused vars in kebab case. No dash unused dash vars. And now, given the name of this rule, I can go to my .eslintrc.yml and change the behavior of that. Oh, some doubts on Discord. Let's go. In the right bottom, ESLint is red. Here, you see ESLint red. Hmm. And wait a second. ESLint is disabled since its execution has not been approved or denied yet. Use the light bulb menu to open the approval dialog. Okay. And uh, 
Angelo is... Uh, what is this instead? Oh, okay, you've got exactly the same situation. That's why he was laughing. Thanks a lot for pointing out. Um, do you see the light bulb uh, menu? You should be able to see a light bulb somewhere. Uh, for example, if I click on first try, it will, it will show a light bulb here. The light bulb, if I click it, will give me a menu of short fixes. And in your, in both cases, in your both cases, you should be able to see something like enable ESLint. There must be a security measure in your Visual Studio Code that I don't have. Or maybe I already accepted the security measure and I actually didn't remember or didn't know about it. So if you, f if you click on one of these errors and uh, click on the light bulb, I hope that you will see this thing here and I would love it if you made a screenshot of this because I have no idea what this is. But um, in the meantime, I'm going to check on the internet. ESLint is disabled since its execution has not been approved. ESLint is disabled since its execution has not been approved. Let's see. Oh, there's a Stack Overflow. Found the solution, and it's rather simple. Thanks to this site, found the solution that fixed my problem. Gerion2 has mentioned it rightly in his comment. Turns out I had somehow disabled the extension in Visual Studio Code. All I had to do was enable it. There's an icon at the bottom right corner that says ESLint, and if disabled, it's shown with a red icon. All that I had to do was click on it and allow it to be enabled everywhere in the dialog that was shown soon after. So, there is something here. And in fact, you already spotted that there is a, um, there is a, where is that? You didn't send the screenshot about that? Yeah, you did. Yeah, here it is. You spotted that there's a uh, red ES lint on the bottom right. Uh, probably also, if you click there, you should be able to do something about it. But apparently, the problem is that when you go look at the extension in ES lint, you have it disabled and you should click on enable probably or maybe enable globally or something like that have a look at it you should be able to find the solution or if not we will see and in the meantime i'm going to uh i don't know put uh, one of those waiting songs like a uh, Okay, it worked. Thanks. Tiago made it. Angelo, are you... But we can click on the radius lint on the bottom and disable, can't we? Yeah, probably. Exactly. Uh, or enable it. Yes, you probably can do this. Um, yes, lint manage library execution. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think you can do it in multiple ways. Maybe you can click on this. No, if you click on this, I see this output here. How did you do it now, Tiago? I think he went with the light bulb and um, managed the ESLint execution, maybe. Click on the red ESLint. Okay, so Tiago said, click on the red ESLint. If I do it, it will just give me the output, the current output of ESLint, which is not what you have. Instead, you will have some uh, other window that will tell you do you want to allow ESLint? Yes, allow everywhere, says Tiago. And then you've got it. Are you using Windows, by the way? Maybe this is a, a thing related to Windows. Or maybe not, I don't know. Worked great, thanks guys. Awesome! Again, the community is strong and it helps me a lot in dealing with these problems thanks a lot yes windows for me okay so i want this problem that is spotted by eslint to not be seen as an error i want to see it as a warning because I, if i declare a function on a crappy laptop though nah come on um if i have a function that i declared and i don't want to invoke it right now i don't want to see an error in my code maybe i just want to see a warning so let's remember this name no unused vars now that i remember this name i can go to eslintrc yml and in the rules section watch out i'm going to remove these curly braces and the space i'm going to go to a new line the new line should be indented i'm going to create a child of this rules line so it must have some indentation 
And now that I have an indentation, I'm going to write no unused. Yeah, I have to write it correctly. No unused vars column. And here I can say worn. Watch out. Rules. I go to a new line. There's no curly braces. I remove them completely. And then I go to a new line. Indent, because it must be indented. It must be a child of rules. And then no unused vars in kebab case, all lowercase, separated by dashes. And then colon worn. If everything goes well, I should go back to functions reprise and see the error not being an error anymore. It's a warning. In fact, it's underlined in yellow rather than in red. So now it's still a problem, but it's not that important as a problem. So ESLint by default gives you a set of rules, among which we have this rule called on no unused vars, and no unused vars by default will give you an error. The and it's exactly the same as saying no unused wars error. If I write it like this, I will see that it's still an error. But I can override this behavior by specifying something different. For example, I don't want it to be an error. I want it to be a warning. I want to warn. Or I can even completely switch off the rule and I will say off. I think. Yep. You see? Um, there are also numbers that you can use. So, for example, 2 means error, and I think this will still give me an error. Uh, 1 means worn. Yeah, it's yellow. And 0 means that it's switched off. Yep. But I would still use um, words, because words uh, have more meaning for us humans. Okay? So, no unused vars colon warn and now this error became just a warning just tell me if you have any problems with this rule and its uh, application by the way is it true that if i go to discord you can see my face more than my code probably yes uh, there was a setting that i don't remember if i did it no it's not true okay so discord still looks you're looking at uh it's full screen but if I go here, then you see my, uh, my, my face. Okay. Okay, I see. Um, no, it's fine. I see Discord and your face small on the side. Okay, yeah, this is exactly what I, what, I, what I expected. Instead, if I switch to the Twitch chat on my computer, now you see my face. Yes. Okay, that was intended. Um, I'm using a feature of uh, OBS, which is called Automatic S Scene Switcher or something like that. So I decided that when I see some windows, uh, it will switch to a scene, which is the coding scene right now. And if I go to some other windows, like the Twitch chat, it will switch to my face uh, scene. Okay, this was one of the things that I wanted to show you. And another thing that I wanted to show you is, well, console log. Console log right now doesn't give me any errors at all, and that's fine. But if you're writing code for production, if you're writing code for people to use it, console log is usually not uh, something that you want to keep in your code. Because console log, as the name says, it's just, uh, ha has just the purpose of logging things. Uh, to debug and you don't want to place debug statements in your code because it looks pretty uh, pretty mm, how do you say amateur and uh, and also maybe you are exposing some information that you don't want to expose to the public so it would be better as soon as you ship your code on the internet or anywhere, if, you're, if your code becomes available elsewhere, it would be better if you completely removed any occurrences of console log from your code base. It's still a good help when you're developing, but as soon as you ship it online, you should remove all the console logs. That's why I usually put another rule here, among the rules, my standard rules, which is no-console 
colon warn. I still use this as a warning. Some people are stricter and prefer to use it as an error. But if I say no console warn, then ESLint will find every single occurrence of my console logs and will tell me if I need uh, th that I need to, to remove them. It is pretty difficult to find all the errors in all of my files, but there's another way. Now, if you go on the bottom left part of Visual Studio Code, you will see that we've got zero errors and 16 warnings. So I can just click on this thing and it will open the problems panel, which is showing all the problems that ESLint was able to find so far. Unfortunately, these, these are not the only problem. These are not all the problems that we have in our code base. These are the only the problems that we that ESLint could find on the open files. But there are so many other problems now on our code base that are not uh, listed here. And in order to find them, we just need to open our files. So for example, I open function hoisting. Nope, no problems in here. Function declaration. There is an error. Oh, the error is here. As you can see, this is another important thing. When I have an error on my code, and this error is a syntax error because I already declared a variable and I cannot redeclare it uh, again. So I have to fix this error. And now I've got another error. But if I have syntax errors, as you already seen, we cannot auto format our code and we cannot perform linting on our code. We have to first fix all the syntactical errors and then ESLint will be able to run. The error now is fixed because I'm reassigning a value to X and Y, but uh, I'm not redeclaring them. But I still have another error and I see it here in the in the outline of my code. There's still an error here on this line and it's still the same error. I have to remove this thing here. Now the errors are all solved and my code is worse than before. Look how many errors and warnings are now listed in the outline because in this code I'm using a lot of console logs that I don't want to keep and a lot of unused functions that I want, don't want to keep. I'm even redeclaring functions, which is not syntactically wrong, but ESLint says no, you should never redeclare functions. So ESLint adds more strictness to the standard JavaScript. And I don't want to fix all these problems right now because there's no need to. Sorry, what does no console check for exactly? Yes, uh, no console is looking for any statements like console log, and it will tell you that console log, you, you should never put console log in your code. And the reason is that console log is used for debugging purposes. Whenever you need to create something to be enjoyed by, the, by a user, you're never going to use console log to display things to the user. In fact, as you already know, the things that you put in console log are only shown to the, to the developer who already knows how to open the console. But a user, a generic user of your website or your application will probably not even know about this console thing. Uh, they want to see the output in the page or uh, in the editor or uh, in a graphical user interface, not in the console. That's why I personally use this rule here, no console warn, just to keep track of all the console logs that I left around in the code. So as soon as I finish debugging my code, I can just remove all these console logs from my code base. So this code is pretty crappy because it's doing a lot of redeclarations, uh, it's using a lot of never used fun and never used variables, never used functions. It's uh, redeclaring. Uh, final string was even even not defined, so I'm I'm doing console log of final string, but the final string was never defined before. So I probably wouldn't have found this problem if it weren't for ESLint. 
So as you can see, ESLint is giving me a lot of help. Right now, I'm just going to ignore all the help that ESLint is giving me because, of course, this file was intended for teaching purposes. So we did some, uh, some experiments, some trials and errors, and I'm documenting everything in this file. This is not production ready code. Uh, so my code will probably behave different from this. But for example, if I look at um, uh, the prime numbers, where's the prime numbers thing? Um, prime numbers. Yep, functional prime numbers. This look, looks pretty well. Uh, Tiago says, I think no console warn is working for me. Okay, if it isn't working, it is possible that you still have errors in your code that prevent ESLint to run on your code. Um, if you're not sure about that, you can send me a screenshot of your code and we will see we will see if there are any red markers anywhere around. Waiting for Tiago's screenshot or solution. Uh, if I go to functional prime numbers, I see that this code is pretty fine. The only problem is this console log. I don't want to console log. Maybe I want to do a document write as Bobby would do instead of console log. Document write is fine because I'm writing to the web page. Console log is not fine because this thing will be outputted to my developer tools, not the user's uh, eyes. Mine wasn't working too because I didn't save the file. Now it's working well. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, uh, sometimes you need to also save the file to make uh, ESLint aware of, uh, of the file itself. Yeah, ESLint is not working in a, uh, in, in a user-friendly way sometimes. But anyway, this is the only stuff that I wanted to show you about code quality. And it's something that is not covered by the tutorials, but I think it's pretty important. Nowadays, you probably never go writing JavaScript code without prettifying it with Prettier and also linting it with ESLint. So Tiago, you see the outline here on the right? You've got a red line. So you can uh, go to that part of your code and I think that that part of the code is actually line 17 and you have uh, an error here and it also says it uh, here below parsing error identifier shouted string has already been declared so there's ESLint oh, okay no wait this is still ESLint working so could you please show me the ESLint RC YML file maybe there is something wrong in there. I'm going to show you my version, which is no dash console, all kebab case, colon, worn, worn. Uh, ESLint is working because it's already getting the problem on line 17. So if it's not working for uh, line six, where, is, where there's console log, maybe there is some problems. Um, no, I see no problems here. No console won. So what is the problem here? Not really sure. Did you already save the file and see if anything changed? This should actually work. No console won. Ah, uh, yes, recommended. Rules, no news barn, no console won. Uh, the indentation is correct. You went to even a new line, that's fine. So Sal says that she had to just save the file to make things work. I don't know if this is your case. Another thing that you can do, I, I, I know it's stupid, but another thing that you can do is to close the file and reopen it again. Because sometimes ESLint just messes up and doesn't see the, the changes that you make on your files. Sometimes ESLint looks, for, um, looks at a cached version of your file instead of the new one. I did it and closed the program. You even closed Visual Studio Code, reopen it and uh, still doesn't work. That is quite strange. Uh, what happens if you instead 
What happens if you uh, fix the problem on line 17? Because you, sh you, aren't, uh, you aren't supposed to redeclare variables, especially constants. So please try, for example, to, I don't know, comment out the rest of your code. And uh, this would uh, probably remove all the syntax errors. And in that case, we should be able to, to see it working. In fact, I think that's exactly the problem. What you see here in line 17, this is not an ESLint error. This is an error that prevents ESLint from running. Okay. So once you got your code uh, completely devoid of errors, then ESLint will get into place. Ah, uh, send a print. Oh, where am I? Oh, come on. Oh, okay, I was already here. Okay, yeah, you commented out this stuff and now ESLint is working. Awesome. As you can see, it gets quite tricky at first, but then you get used to it. So, that's it for ESLint and that's it for code quality. Now we know how to make our code good. We know how to format it well, we know how to write it well. We also have tools that allow us to uh, format it well and, uh, and also code it well. But remember, that's not all, it's not just a matter of syntax. It's also a matter of how you name variables, you name functions, you comment your code, you use meaningful names, etc., etc. So another thing that you must do at all costs, and I will do it next Wednesday with you guys, is to read these, uh, this other section about Ninja Code. I called it Ninja Code. No, they called it Ninja Code too, which is a series of best practice that you should uh, follow as much as you can in order to avoid writing bad code. And remember, this is ironic. So you have to do exactly the opposite of what they say. And one of the things that uh, I really like about bad code is this Hadouken code in which you have this really nested if-else cascade, which looks like Ryu or Ken performed on a Hadouken on it. And now we can move to the second part of this lesson, which is all about objects. Are you ready? Yay! Let's forget about ESLint, let's forget about NPM. Hey, we've got a visitor here. Hi, Anonymous Lemmer. And uh, now we're going to look at object literals. I'm going to skip some parts of this uh, section about objects uh, because some of these things are a little bit optional and a little more advanced, but I'm going to give you what you need in order to pass any uh, coding interview or uh, just to work uh, with, with JavaScript in web development. So I will tell you right away what is the reason why we need objects and, uh, and then we can see the syntax. Because in uh, earlier editions of my courses, I saw that people really struggle to understand a concept when they don't know why we are doing this. So, uh, objects, JS. The reason why objects are so useful is because some of you already told me Oh my god, I don't want to write so many variables. Uh, I want to do a sum of numbers. And I have to say, let num1 is equal to 2. Let num2 is equal to 3. And oh, <laughs> I'm writing it wrong. Let num3 is equal to 6, etc, etc. I don't want to declare a variable for every single value. Isn't there a way to store all these values in just one variable? Yes, there are multiple ways. And one of these ways is called an object. An object is, uh, has a very simple syntax and it has some gotchas which you have to mind a little bit. Uh, I'm going to declare an object like this. Let obj is equal to open close brackets, uh, curly braces. 
So as you can see, the curly braces are pretty important in programming and especially in JavaScript, they have multiple meanings. They usually open and close a code block, like in an if-else cascade or in a for statement, in a for loop or uh, in functions. And in JavaScript, they also are used to describe an object. This is an, an empty object. It's an object, it's a container that doesn't have anything inside. And we will see how to put things inside of this object. But before, I would like, to, uh, would like to, you guys to understand what kind of element is this object. An object is, looks like a cabinet, a cabinet containing files. The variables that we saw so far just, were just labels to certain files. But now, with this object, we have a cabinet in which we can store multiple files and uh, store them given their name, which we usually call key. They are stored as key value pairs which is something not really that new to you because I already use these terms, for example, when I, uh, when I said something on the package JSON. I said that this is the key and this is the value. These are all key value pairs. And now I can tell you that JSON stands for JavaScript Object notation. So when you see JSON files, this is exactly a description of a JavaScript object. Objects are done like this. They, have, they are delimited by curly braces and they contain key value pairs separated by columns. Well, the key and value are separated by columns and key value pairs are separated by commas, not semicolons, just commas. These Key, these values can be of any kind. Here you can see that these values are strings and the keys are always strings too. But the values can also be of any other kind. For example, in here, scripts is a key with a value that is not an, a string. It's actually another object. So you can have objects containing other objects if you want to. And those objects contain, in turn, other key value pairs. For example, in this case, the object that is stored with a key of scripts has a key value pair test with this thing here which is a string as a value but we can have multiple nested situations so this is an empty object and if i want to make it not empty you know what i'm going to call it empty object okay this is an empty object and JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So, in fact, when you re create JSON files, you're actually describing J JavaScript objects. And if I want to have a non-empty object, like uh, let, let's say um, a person. A person is not a number. A person is not a string. A person is a complex thing that has multiple things. A person can have a name, an age. Uh, a person can have a tax code, or a person can have limbs, can have eyes. And I want to use, uh, to, I want to have a structure, a data structure that helps me describe the complexity of uh, a complex thing that is not just a number or a string. Well, the, per the, the object is perfect for this reason. In fact, a person, for example, is an object that can contain whatever I want it to contain. For example, a name. The person has a name. And I will say that my name is Anthony. It's not actually Anthony, it's Matteo Anthony, but I never know how to name myself. Uh, any, every person that meets me for the first time, is it, is it Matteo or is it Anthony? How should I call you? I don't know. It's actually pretty difficult for me. Uh, my name is Matteo Anthony and <laughs> I never know how to be called. Okay, let's say Matteo Anthony. If you want to call me Matteo Anthony, that's a mouthful, but it's fine. Uh, some people prefer to call me Matteo. My family calls me Matteo. And uh, pretty much every el everybody else, friends, call me Anthony. So you call me Anthony if you think you're, uh, you're my friend. You call me Matteo if you think you're part of my family. And I consider you both my friends and my family. So that's the same for me. So person is a 
container, is a classifier, is a com is a is a cabinet that can contain multiple files with a name, a special name, which is must be unique because otherwise I won't be able to get that specific value and any value you want, for example, a string. Name Matteo Anthony. Age is uh, the time of writing 38. And this is a value of a number. And what if I can uh, what if I want to put another name? Something else. Ooh, I've got a complaint by ES Lint. ES Lint says, hey, in an object you shouldn't put duplicate keys. All right, no, I should put uh, another thing. For example, nickname. Okay, yeah, nickname is valid because it has another uh, another name. And my nickname on GitHub is Ice on Fire. So, you see, you can describe complex things. And you can do a lot more stuff. For example, um, you can uh, say that the person has a body. And the body is another very complex thing, so it's comprised of body parts. So I can say that the body is an object. I've got an error. Why is it that? Well, because every key value pair must be separated by commas. I should never forget commas. Is the comma between the keys obligatory? Uh, obligatory? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. In fact, that's exactly what I messed up. Okay, you just explained. Uh, in JavaScript, you're also allowed to put an extra comma here, even if you don't have anything else after. This is called a trailing comma. And uh, in ESLint, you can decide if you like trailing commas and you want to keep them, or if you don't like trailing commas and you want to remove them. Um, but this thing about trailing commas is probably now more part of uh, prettier than ESLint because a trailing comma is more like a stylistic, stylistic thing than a real syntax thing. So as far as I know, trailing commas are allowed in modern JavaScript and you can keep them like this. I think that trailing commas are pretty useful. In fact, I'll show you why. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to do things quickly, but you're not supposed to code with me. You know what, I'm going to do it, yeah, I'm going to do it here. So let's say that I have name, age, and nickname, and I don't have a trailing comma. Now I want to move age at the bottom. I can do it by using my shortcuts, alt, up, and down, alt, arrow, up, and down. And if I move this thing down, the code breaks. The code breaks because I have to put a comma here in order to make this work. Instead, starting from the same situation. If I already had a trailing comma, then moving this age down will just give me no errors at all. And I don't even need to mind where to put a comma. Where should I put a comma? Everywhere except the last line. No, I just want to put a comma everywhere. So this just works every single time. Okay? So I think that the trailing comma is quite good. And if I save my file, I see that the trailing comma remains, which means that the automatic formatter prettier is probably deciding to leave a trailing comma. If I go to the documentation and if I look for trailing, nope, uh, let's go to the configuration, configuration, options. Trailing, ooh, there is an option in uh, ESLIN, uh, in Prettier, sorry. There is an option in Prettier that says trailing commas. The default value changed from none to ES5 starting from version 2.0.0 of Prettier. So now we are going to use, by default, this version of trailing commas. And the trailing commas are there whenever it is valid in ES5. So in objects, arrays, etc. ES5 is an old version of ECMAScript, but it's a version that works in every browser, even Internet Explorer right now, at least the version 11. 
Um, but if I want to change this, I can say that I want all the trailing commas, which means that uh, Prettier will add trailing commas wherever possible, including trailing commas in function parameter lists and calls. And this requires Node 8 or a modern browser that supports ES2017 or code that can be transformed with a tool called Babel, which we haven't discussed yet. So I think that the, the default ES5 is fine. And that's why we have the trailing comma kept here. If I remove it and save the file, Prettier will re-add it again because it's so convenient to have this trailing comma. I can move things around, I can add things, I can remove properties and still everything works without need for me to uh, care about where to place the commas. So I can have another property here, body. And the body can have body parts. For example, I don't know, eyes, two, nose, one, big one, mouth, still one, and uh, arms, two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm, I'm putting numbers, but it could be anything. It could be, I don't know, is there something that I can describe without numbers, but with strings or anything? I don't even know. Um, I don't know. No fantasy here. Um, nope. Okay, let's just put legs for uh, for the sake of, uh, com of of completeness, and then that's it. So you can put whatever you want, and as you can see, the bot the person is an object that can contain multiple key value pairs. Key value pairs can be of any kind, even objects. So the body key has as a value an object which contains in turn multiple key value pairs, which can be objects or other st strings, numbers, any type you know. One day we will see arrays, and yeah, we can put also arrays there, okay? Uh, there's nothing very new about objects because we already stumbled upon objects multiple times. For example, math is an object. And how do I know that it's an object? Because math contains something and I can get that something from math by using the dot symbol, the dot uh, key, the, I don't know, the dot character. If I say math.py, this probably means that I have an object called math that contains a value stored as pi. In fact, if I want to redefine for some reason the math object, I could call it like this, const math. I'm using exactly the same convention, so capital M and the rest is lowercase. Const math is an object. We should also add a semicolon at the end. Let's just remember that. Semicolons, if we want to be strict, should be placed at every end of a statement, even when we declare objects. And math contains multiple properties, but for now I'm focusing on the property called pi, which is usually indented, but here indentation is not that important. Pi has a value of, let's round it, to 20, 20, uh, 22 divided by 7. Be why 22 divided by 7? Because I already told you that 22 divided by 7 is actually a pretty good approximation of pi. If you try to do this on your calculator, you see 3.14, blah, 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 very close. Well, close enough. That's uh, engineer level close enough. For a physicist, it's not close enough. For a mathematician, it, it's probably very, very bad as an approximation. But for engineer, yeah, that's fine. It's enough. You know the... Um, the old saying that uh, for the optimist, the glass is, uh, is, uh, is half full. For the pessimist, the glass is half empty. But for an engineer, the glass is, um, has a capacity which is double the uh, required amount. So you could access an object like console.log.person.h. Whoa, that's awesome. Yes, Angelo, exactly. So now you're starting to infer, you're starting to deduct the, um, the syntax 
instead of learning it by heart. Exactly, that's it. So if I want to get the pi value of math, I can console log or do whatever I want of math.py. And if I want to know the name of the person, I can do something like console log person dot name. And if I want to go deeper, I can console log person dot body dot arms. So I can get any single value. Well, actually, I can also console log the body itself, person dot body. And it will not give you uh, a number. It will probably give you something else, which is worth looking at. So we're going to stay here for, for, for a while. So to create an empty object, you just open and close curly braces. That's it. To create a full object, you can now um, just put key value pairs. The key is always a string and you can put single quotes, you can put double quotes, you can probably even put um, backticks, but no backticks probably not. Okay, doesn't like backticks, but I'm pretty sure that you can put uh, single quotes. But in JavaScript, they are not required and they make the code a little less readable. So I think that Pritya will run through my code and will just remove those quotes. Yep, as a key, we don't need to put quotes. But as a value, yes, I have to make a distinction between a string value and a number value. There is a huge difference, as you know, between 38 and the string 38. So in this case, as a value, I have to put quotes. But in the key, I don't need to. And this is a slight difference that you have between a JavaScript object and a JSON object. Because as I already told you, in a JSON object, like the package JSON, everything should be in double quotes. Not even single quotes, everything should be in double quotes. And in JSON, you don't have trailing commas. I cannot put this trailing comma. This is an error in JSON. So there are some differences between JavaScript objects and JSON objects. But still, they are both very important. Okay, let's have a look at what we will have when we console log this stuff. But I want to do it uh, live. So I'm going to copy this. You know, I'm, I'm going to start with the empty object. Um, Opening a new browser window, opening the developer tools, console log here. I can do this on Node.js, of course, but I think it's uh, way easier to do it here. Let empty obj is equal to an empty object. I press enter, and now I've got this variable, which is called empty obj. Shall we inspect it? If I do empty obj, we can have a look at its value. And the value is this thing here. It looks empty, but it's actually not. In fact, if I click on this arrow, expanding it, I will see that it contains something. It's a hidden object, it's a hidden thing, which is called underscore underscore proto underscore underscore. And I will tell you, this is something that we cared about in earlier days of JavaScript, but nowadays we don't care about it anymore. There is a, a thing here called prototypical inheritance, which is uh, part of the language, of, is part of the syntax, but nowadays we are not using it explicitly. We are using uh, another kind of inheritance, or probably we're trying to avoid inheritance at all. This is what I usually do. I prefer other things uh, rather than inheritance. So you don't need to care about prototypical inheritance. If you're curious about it, I can tell you something about it. But it could be really confusing. So let's just completely forget this proto. This proto has a lot of things and we don't really care about it. The only thing that we care maybe, maybe, is that uh, in proto you have... Uh, some uh, things here, like the toString function, which means that probably empty obj, even if it's empty, it already has some things that we can inspect inside. It's not really empty. It has a toString function, for example. In fact, this is something that I didn't tell you, but you know, an object can have any kind of value, even functions. And in fact, I can say speak 
speak will hold the value of function a function expression in which I'll say console log hello world oh my w is going to to fail me more and more so finally you understand where to use function expressions function expressions are these functions that are usually anonymous that you can attach to something in this case I'm giving this function as the value of one of my uh, of the properties that we have on the object person I wrote fast but I'm also stopping here so please feel free to catch up with the code I also see crazy eight grape following thanks a lot hi nice to see you here remember guys to uh, join the discord server if you want to be part of the community I'm going to invite again by generating the invitation link I still don't know how to generate the one-time generation link and make it available forever but here it is this is the invitation link for anybody who wants to join the community and uh, and help each other and uh, also share stupid memes etc etc so if I did let my number of arms is equal to uh, okay this looks like a link so it was deleted but I, I understand will it attribute the type number to the variable I created yes again yes this is exactly what you can do with it so person body arms is navigating through the properties of the person and through the properties of the body and it it, it goes to arms and now I can do whatever I want with this value I can console log it or I can store it in a variable person's arms is person.body.arms and yes person's arms is a, a constant which holds a number which is the value that I find by navigating this tree-like structure person.body.arms the value will be 2 awesome it, it, it's beautiful that you are coming up with your own syntax which is ex exactly the syntax that is uh, the syntax of objects so as you can see there's no surprise objects follow the principle of least surprise you can come up with your own um, ideas on the syntax and it's correct so as you can see we can even add functions as properties so let me do it again I'm going to copy this let person refresh everything now if I do person dot name it says Matteo Anthony if I do person dot age it will give me 38 if I say person dot nickname it will say ice on fire and if I say person dot body it will give me an object that contains all of these properties and if I want to go deeper person dot body dot nose it will just say one which has the value of two noses okay pretty pretty easy to navigate through this object and since the person is also able to speak I can also say person dot speak it's a function this is a reference to the function an anonymous function that I assigned to the property speak but since it's a function I can do person dot speak invoking the function itself and it says hello world and this is exactly what we have for example in math or in console log uh, in math we have math.py yes but we also have math.pow for example which calculates the power of two numbers I will write it as an arrow function because why not it looks better so pow of uh, um, a and b will give me as an arrow function a raised to the power of b okay and if I have such an object I now I'm now overriding the math object that is already provided by JavaScript and I can say hey math what is pi pi is roughly this number here you see 2020 uh, come on 22 divided by 7 
actually looks a lot like uh, pi. And uh, math, could you please calculate 2 to the power of 3? It's 8. Yes, it is. What about 2 to the power of 4? 16. And 5? 32. 64. You see? So, now we are able to understand some object that we were using for, uh, for a while. A console log is also an object. Console, console is an object. And console has multiple methods. We are using log a lot. But there's also other methods that we can ask to the console. For example, info or group or dear. What happens if I try... Let's see what if I... Uh, let's see what happens if I do console dear person. Well, not what I expected. Maybe it was not dear. Uh, let me show... Was there something like table? Table. There is a table. Let, let me find... Let me see. Console.table of person. Ooh, it shows a table with uh, all the values of person shown uh, in a table-like structure. So this would be nice for Angelo since he is used to Excel tables. So we see the index. I wouldn't call it index. I would probably call it uh, the, the key. The key is name, nickname, age, and body. And name has the value of Matteo, Matteo Anthony. Nickname has the value of Ice on Fire. Age has the value of 38. And body has a nested value. So we have to go to eyes, nose, mouth, arms, and legs. And this is also the uh, object-like structure. So console has multiple functions that we can use. When a function belongs to an object, we usually call it method for some reason. Okay, uh, they are almost interchangeable. A function is a generic function. A method is a function that belongs to an object, that is attached to an object. Uh, I will probably sometimes call them functions or methods, and they probably are pretty much the same. I wouldn't discuss too much on the, on the formalisms here. Okay, let's go back to the, um, to the tutorial. So... There's also another way to declare objects, which is this one here, new object. Don't do this. Never do this. Just use the object literal syntax. Uh, it's the standard way. And uh, it is even possible that if I do something like this, const uh, complex object is equal to new object, it is possible that someone will also complain. Let's see. No, ESLint is not complaining for that. Okay, but I think that it should complain, because if you want to create an object, you should definitely create just a object literal instead of this thing here, okay? And I said object, object. Seeing the table, an object is not the same as the array you talked about earlier, right? Uh, no, in fact, it's not really, the, it's not exactly the same. But an array is an object, it's a special kind of object, and that's why we're looking at objects right now, and then we will look at arrays as a special kind of object that has many very, very cool features that we will use. But for now, let's stick with just objects, just to, trying to ignore the existence of arrays. Okay, so this is the object literal. And uh, as you can imagine, the user in this case is like a cabinet that contains two files, name and age. But the cool thing about uh, JavaScript and programming in general is that a cabinet can contain other cabinets, just like folders can contain other subfolders. And the leaf of this tree-like structure is always files, which in this case is usually values. Values which can be objects. Um, I'm gonna say something stupid. Uh, the person can also have a calculator. And the calculator could be a reference to another object, for example, the math object. If I do something like this, uh, let's see what happens. Never tried this before, actually. But uh, let's see. You can come up with your own things. Uh, try to break the code and see, see what you can and what you cannot do. Uh, right now, I'm uh, declaring a person with all these properties and a property called calculator, which has a value of math. Could you close the terminal in Visual Studio Code? Yes, yes, definitely. Sorry. 
So if I do this and I say person.calculator, oh, I've got a reference to the math object which contains everything that I need to do calculations. So I stole the math object that is already provided by a browser and I said, this is my calculator. So now from the calculator, I can ask, for example, what is the absolute value of minus five? Five. What is this abs function? Well, it's one of the methods that math has, which given any number, uh, negative or a positive, it will all gi always give you the absolute values, value, which is the positive. Um, so minus five, absolute value is five. Absolute value of five is five itself. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we can even uh, borrow or even steal things and place them in our own objects. So this worked, awesome. Uh, let's go back to the um, tutorial and let's see what else we can do. As you can see here, we are getting the property values uh, by just addressing them, separating the, 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 the layers of the structure with dots. This is called dot notation. And I'm, I'm saying this because there's another dot notation that we can uh, see. Uh, and we will see it right after the coffee break because it's five minutes to the coffee break. But the last thing that I want to show you before the coffee break is that just like you can get the value of properties in an object with dot notation, you can even set the value of properties using dot notation. And it's pretty straightforward. If you know how variables work, you know how this thing work. In fact, if you declare a variable like a const value is equal to two, you know how to declare a variable and you know how to assign a value. But let's say that now you've got another object, uh, values, you can do two cool things. Uh, values can have one property. Let's call it property one. Property one is three. Now, if we have an object called values, in order to change the value of property one, we can access it like values.property1. Pretty straightforward. And then we can assign this property a new value. For example, five. And there's also another very cool thing that we can do with objects. In fact, if there is not a property called uh, value two, uh, property two, values dot property two, if this property doesn't exist, but I still want to assign a value, well, this property will be automatically added instead of just replacing. So with this notation, you can either get the values from an object or you can change the existing value of a property inside of the object or you can even add a new property inside of the object and assign a new value. There's just one thing that you need to do with an object because in programming everything turns out to be just a matter of reading things, creating things, updating things and deleting things. There's nothing else that you can do. If you do anything in a software, like a, a login, a login is probably a matter of reading some value, creating some value, or updating or deleting some value. Everything is a matter of CRUD operations. And CRUD means create, read, or someone says retrieve, which is pretty much the same update and delete. So in objects, you already know how to do three of these things. You can read a value from the property by using dot notation. You can add a value to a property with dot notation by just assigning a value to a property that doesn't exist in the object. You can update the value of a property if it exists already. And how to delete a property? Well, there's a keyword called delete. Delete values dot property one. And this way you can delete one property from the object. That's it for now. We'll have a coffee break.
But before that, since I wrote too fast, I'm leaving you again still one minute to copy or to give give me questions or any doubts, any problems, any memes, any any cheers. Could you please say hello? Because I'm saying hello world, but the world doesn't say hello back. I would love to see you interacting just by just by saying hello sometimes. Would you be able to access property two with the delete if you haven't declared it inside the object? Hello, says Diago. Hi, well, enjoy your coffee. Okay, Bobby says, would you be able to access property two with the delete if you haven't declared it inside the object? Um, strange question, because you do not access a property with the delete. So, I'm not really sure what you... Oh, yeah, you're saying. What happens if I delete values dot non-existing property? Is this what you're saying? I think it will still work. It will probably do nothing. And we can see it immediately. Let's see. Const value is this. And then delete values dot non-existing property. What happens? Yeah, it says true, even. It, in it, it returns something. It returns probably the successful deletion. But nothing happened actually because there was no such uh, property so it just uh, completely ignore this thing yes i was rushing with the explanation and had much time that's all that, that's fine so five minutes of coffee break enjoy your coffee see you in five minutes bye
a few moments later. Back again? Hi! So, how was your coffee? I didn't have one because I'm already... Uh, but I had some yogurt. Love yogurt. So, I think we are pretty good with objects so far, right? You're still here with me. Not really that difficult once you understood very well how variables work, how functions work. Now you know that, a, that an object is just a collection of uh, multiple properties that you can group together and it holds, it stores things and you can do, perform any kind of CRUD operations on objects. You can create new properties by just uh, taking for granted that they exist and assigning a new value which instead creates the new property if it doesn't exist. You can read a property by using dot notation, as we saw, like uh, person.name, person.body, or person.body.arms. And you can update properties pretty easily by just uh, assigning a new value to a property that, in this case, exists already. And you can delete properties with the delete keyword. And that's the reason why you cannot use this as a variable name. Of course, you cannot say probably something like let delete is equal to one. Mm, nope, not working. Because delete is a reserved keyword. But objects give you even another cool thing. You can create an object with reserved keywords. Don't do it, but you can. So, for example, in an object such as this one, you can create a property called if, a property called for, a property called else, or uh, what do you say, delete, default, whatever you want, you can, because these, as I already told you, these property names are actually strings. They don't look like strings because the single quotes were removed by Pritya, but they are strings, and in a string you can put whatever you want. So if you really, really want to use the delete keyword for a variable name, well, one way you can do it, instead of declaring a variable called delete, you can create an object that contains that variable called delete. That way you can. But please don't. Don't try to force things. Usually when I need to call something delete, I call it remove. For example, I want to create a function that deletes some element I don't call it delete because I cannot, I just call it remove. Remove, uh, remove user from database. Okay, if I have this kind of uh, long named function, I can also call it delete user from database, that's fine. But uh, if you still want to use just delete, you cannot. And in that case, just use remove. Or you can put anything inside of an object like uh, const database is an object that contains multiple uh, multiple properties um, I'm writing bad code really bad code <laughs> the database object can contain the create function uh, let's call let's do the, the let's do it like this uh, it can have the update function it can have the delete function, and I can call it delete even if it's not proper. And I can also have the read. I will put it here. Read is another arrow function that does something. Okay? And I created a stub of database that can perform any kind of CRUD operations and persist them somewhere. Okay, I was just messing around with the code. You're not supposed to write this because I'm not showing you a real database or I'm not even going to implement uh, this database. Maybe one day we'll create some kind of stub database if we want to. We can do it uh, very soon, actually. Probably could even become a, an exercise that I'll give you next Wednesday. Let's see, let's see. Um, there are some other things to, to know about objects which are pretty easy and then we will move to other things about objects which are more complicated. So I will give you a warning bell, a warning sign when things get messy and you have to pay 
extra attention. So you get properties like this, you change properties like this, or you can add properties like this, because if the property is admin was not there, then it will be added automatically. And you can de delete by using the delete operator, delete, delete keyword. So if you have the user, which has name, age, and is admin, and you delete user age, you get a cabinet that contains name and is admin, but doesn't have age anymore. Um, if you really, really want to, you can give to property names any name, including spaces. But if you put spaces, then you have to add these quotes. Otherwise, JavaScript, as you can imagine, is not able to understand when a key stops, when a, when a key starts and a key ends. So I like yogurt. Is it, is it really like this? True. Uh, as you can see, this is not recognized as a key. But if I wrap it, wait a second, there's an X to you. Uh, is it with an H in, in English? Nope. Or also yes. Okay, you, I will say it without the H. Um, if you put quotes, then this is recognized correctly as a key. If you don't put these uh, quotes, then JavaScript will fail to understand that this is uh, the key, uh, this, this extra space that wasn't, uh, that wasn't expected by the language. So we have to put uh, quotes. But as a best practice, don't do anything fancy for keys. Don't use spaces. Don't even use dashes. Dashes suffer from the same problem. If you like kebab case, this is not good still. If you really have to give a name which needs more than one word, then use camel case because camel case is always well accepted in JavaScript in any other programming language of this sort. So just use camel case and never use spaces you can also use underscores you can use the snake case sometimes i have to use snake case because the server that sends me the data uses this convention but if if it was not for that i would always use camel case and um, now if you want to use spaces you shouldn't, but if you really want to use spaces, then we've got another problem. And the problem is that if I want to access the, for example, the de default property, you know what? I don't like the reserve keywords objects. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it in my person because the person called Matteo Anthony Eisen Fire has age of 38 and likes yogurt. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think it's better if we stick with the, with this example. So let me just copy the person again. And I'm going to put it here. So you can copy it from here too. The person has a name, has a nickname, has an age, has also a property, like yogurt, which has a value of true. But this property is written with spaces and it's strange. Uh, then we've got body, we've got speak, we've got calculator. So, if I want to know the name of the person, person.name, easy. But if I want to know the likes yogurt property of the person, I have a problem. Because I cannot put it like this. This means person.likes and then yogurt. So, is it good if I put the single quote? Not even. This doesn't work. Uh, so the notation here is slightly different. We have to put the key in a string, in quotes, and we have to uh, resign from using, re refrain from using the dot notation, and we have to use another notation, which is kind of confusing sometimes. It's a bracket notation. We use square brackets. So person, square brackets, and then the name of the key as a string in quotes. This way we are able to access this property. And square brackets can be used also to get all the other properties. For example, person.name 
can also be retrieved like person square brackets string name it's exactly the same thing watch out because you also have to put the strings person dot name like this has a completely different meaning because name as I say it here is a variable and I don't have a variable called name I have a string called name it stored inside of the object but I don't have a variable called name so person dot name without single quotes is not going to work it's undefined why is it undefined because a person doesn't have a value associated with the name oh there is a name oh yeah sure because the browser has this default name variable uh, let's go with a person dot age if I do person age in as a string I will be able to get my age but if I do person square brackets age without the quotations it's going to break because I'm looking for a variable called age which I don't know so mind the difference between dot notation which is actually very easy and the bracket notation which is slightly more difficult you have to add brackets instead of dots and you also have to state the name of the property in quotes so why bother using bracket notation if the dot notation is better sometimes you are forced to use bracket notation one example is this one if you have a strange property that cannot be accessed through dot notation but there's also another reason and the reason is to have things dynamic let's say that you don't know which property you want to look at you want to ask for example the user so let property name is equal to prompt we will never get rid of prompt prompt what do you want to know so I don't know in advance what property I want to inspect I'll ask the user the user will tell me I want to know the name or I want to know the age I want to know the body the the arms whatever you want so what do you want to know uh, I want to know the um, the age okay so now property name has a value of age if I inspect property name it's age but I don't know it in advance until I do the prompt so now I can say person dot uh, person square brackets property name and this will give me 38 as you can see this is a little more abstract than what we saw so far before we were able to get the person's name or the person's age because we know in advance what we want but here using bracket notation we are able to calculate or retrieve what property I want and then uh, retrieve the property value of the person by using square brackets and as you can see here I'm not using the single quotes because in this case my intention is to use whatever value was stored in the variable property name to get the value of the property you see the slight difference so let's recap I can do person.name person.body person.bodyarms we can do whatever we want I cannot do console log person dot uh, person dot likes yogurt this fails as you can see it's wrong and the only way you can make it work instead is with console log person bracket notation and in string likes yogurt why string because the property names the keys of the properties here are strings they are all strings even age is a string but since this is obviously obviously a string whenever I save my code you will see that age is uh, has these strings omitted they were removed by Pritya because it, it, there's no use to put those extra strings but if we have some spaces or some dashes some strange characters that are not allowed then in that case I have to use strings
Another thing that I can do, however, with bracket notation is that I can say property name or property key. We can call it key. Const key is equal to, let's say, nickname. And then I can use bracket notation to get the person given the generic key. It could be parametric. It can become, it can be the input of a function. I can do whatever I want. So that's the two reasons why we use bracket notation. When we have to deal a property that has a strange name or when we don't know in advance the name of the property and the property should be dynamic, it should be parametric, it should be passed from outside. It's whatever is stored in this variable. And if you do console log person.key you can imagine this has a, a completely different meaning. This is not going to work. This is not going to get the person's nickname. This is going to get the person's key if there is a property called key. But there's not. So this will probably give me undefined. This instead is going to give me the person's nickname, which is in my case Ice on Fire. And this is going to give me true, of course. Hope it makes sense. Was there anything that I wanted to show you here? Yeah, of course. Another thing that I wanted to show you is that if you do console log person bracket notation of string key, this will still give you undefined. In fact, this has exactly the same meaning as the one below. You are getting the property called key from the person if it exists, but it doesn't, so it will be undefined in both ways. This one here, bracket notation without strings, instead is doing person of nickname because the value of key is nickname. So you are passing the value of this variable here. Hope it makes sense. It's, it's pretty logical, actually. It's not something that you have to learn by heart. It's pretty logical if you think about it. But if you still have problems, we can have a thorough look on it. We can do exercises also. We will do exercises next Wednesday, of course, on all of this. Okay, other, other gotchas. <clears throat> you see, likes birds is equal to true, doesn't work. But like this, it works. Like this, it works. And you can also delete. By, of course, you can perform any operations with the square notation, square bracket notation. Um, yeah, this is the dynamic part that I was showing you. So the key is uh, uh, defined elsewhere, and then you can say user of key, whatever the key is. It's exactly as saying user of likes birds, because likes birds is the value stored in the variable key. Oh, there's also the prompts. I'm doing exactly what the tutorial says without even knowing it. Um, and this is the gotcha that I was telling you. If you say let keys equal name and then say user.key, this is not like saying user.name. This is saying user.key. So it expects a property in the user called key. So it's not going to work. And the bracket notation can be also used, this is something that I didn't show you, to do computed properties. So if you initialize an object and you don't know the name of the property in advance, you can use these brackets in here. And this is a new addition that we have starting from uh, ECMAScript, I think seven, not six. Uh, so you can also have a computed property. Uh, let's say I, I ran out of uh, I ran out of fantasy here. What, what does the guy say? Fruit. I don't like fruit. Um, I don't know. Has, has sunglasses. And true. Okay? I do have sunglasses somewhere. Oh, yeah. I've got them here. Here they are. Um, I've got sunglasses. But maybe this property is a property that I don't want to have it engraved in this object. I want to have it coming from elsewhere, maybe from a prompt. So let property name is equal to sunglasses. Or sorry, has sunglasses, if I want to be strict. 
and the property name is a variable and I can use the value stored in this property name here by using the square brackets like this so here property name is dynamic it can change over time we I can have the property name passed as a parameter uh, from uh, from a function so in this case I'm giving the value of true to whatever property is passed to me which makes things very very dynamic these are already more advanced stuff it, it's possible that this kind of uh, dynamic behavior you will never stumble upon it in your daily coding life because usually you know in advance what are the properties on an, of an object but sometimes you have to deal with more abstract problems in which you don't know this uh, property name in advance so this is something a little more abstract more advanced but don't don't worry if uh, if it sounds too difficult right now it will become very very normal at a certain point once you understand the basics okay then property value shorthand mm. Mm. oh yeah yeah this is uh, this is interesting so uh, they are showing you um, a function make user giving a name and an age which returns an object. The object has two properties and also other properties here, but these two properties are called name and age. And the value of name will be whatever is passed from the parameter name. And the value of age is whatever is passed from the parameter age. Uh, watch out, this function is a function that creates an object. And since it's a function that creates an object, some people out there call it a factory function because it's a function that like a factory creates stuff okay so just keep in mind this name factory function if you find it in an interview you know what what it what it, what it is um so what is this property value shorthand you see how redundant it is when you use the same Per name for the property key and the property value you have to re you have to say twice the word name and twice the word age so there is a cool thing that allows you to instead skip one of the two and just say name and age this is exactly the same as saying name column name age column age and this looks very very nice very neat um, I use it a lot um, I use it a lot in special s scenarios that I cannot tell you because they are related to JavaScript models, React, etc. But still, you can do pretty nice things. Like, uh, let, let's create our own um, factory function. I'm going to say it factory function. So, a factory function is something like uh, let's, de uh, let's declare a function called for example make or we usually use also build or uh, create it's up to you the naming convention is completely up to you but the function should be usually a verb in imperative mode that tells to build make create concoction anything you want okay um i'll call it create so create uh create person Ooh. Now we are, we are playing gods. We are going to create persons. <clears throat> going to create people. Create person given, for example, the name and the age. And I'm doing exactly the same thing that we saw right now in the tutorial. So create person can perform any calculations you want. And then at the end, it will return the result of a calculation. In our case, the result of the calculation is just returning an object with these properties. But we can make everything a little more complicated if we want to. We will do it. So I can do something like return a new object that contains as name whatever value was passed as parameter and as age whatever value was passed as parameter. And this is fine. It works. But... I will do another attempt here, which is going to 
complain because create person was already defined and I'm not going to to have a look at it. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to address this pr this problem. Now, since the name of this property key is equal to the name of the property value, we can just skip this part here and just call it name. And the same goes with age. And I didn't tell you, but you can put everything in the same line if you want to. If the uh, code is small enough and you like it like this, you can even put everything in the same line. Preacher is going to keep it like that. As soon as you put one thing on a new line, Preacher is going to put everything on a new line. So this is up to you. If you have a very long complex object that has lots of properties, then Preacher will probably decide to put everything on a new line instead of keeping it all in the same line. <clears throat> but for simple objects like these, uh, it is, uh, it is, well, tolerated, not, not preferred, but it is, it is accepted to have something like this. And as you can see, when you use this shorthand notation, it's actually pretty clean to have this thing here. Return an object that has name and age. I don't know if you, if you got this, but this allows you to overcome the limitation of functions that are always able to return only one thing. If a function is able to return only one thing and you really, really want to return multiple things, well, then you can place them inside of an object and return that object. How cool is that? Okay, uh, remember that this shorthand notation is possible only if the name of the property key is equal to the name of the property value. If you want to do something like uh, name dot to uppercase, so you are changing somehow the the name, uh, the, 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 this part, the, the value part of this uh, of this property, then you cannot turn it into um, into this shorthand notation. You cannot do name to uppercase. You cannot do this because this, if, if you write it like this, it would be exactly like saying, hey, the property name dot to uppercase is equal to name dot to uppercase. This is not what you want. You, you want name to be equal to name dot to uppercase. Okay, that's the reason why we cannot use the shorthand notation when we are changing the, the value here. And we cannot even do it if you do something like this. Let's say that name to uppercase can be stored in its own variable. So const shouted name is equal to this thing here, name to uppercase. And then name will be shouted name. Again, the name of the property key is different from the name of the property value. So you cannot turn this into a shorthand notation. You can do it for the age, but you cannot do it for the name. So here you can remove age and that's fine, but you cannot remove name or shouted name. If I remove shouted name, then name, the name property will hold the value of name, but not shouted name. In fact, yes, Lint is complaining that shouted name is, was assigned a value, but never used. If instead, I put shouted name here in shorthand notation. This object will not have a property called name. It will have a property called shouted name. If you want to have the names being different, you have to do it like this. Or you can reuse the same variable. Name is equal to name to uppercase. Okay, in this case, name is equal to name. And then you can change it into um, shorthand notation but I'm going to go back to this situation here I hope that it's uh, it makes sense to you Bobby can I demand a certain type of data from the user like for the name the only to only accept a string and for the age to only accept numbers and you use the inglorious uh, emoji thanks a lot for that um, a student type of data um, Yes, you probably are able to do this thing, but in a complex way. So I will show you probably later on. Uh, JavaScript, as you know, 
is dynamically typed and it's uh, um, how do I say uh, oh, weekly typed oh my god it's weekly typed so it makes not much difference what the type of a property is so if you want to inspect and uh, do reasonings about the type of things you can use the type of keyword because type of user dot name oh come on uh, sorry I'm a person type of person dot name will give you string and type of uh, person dot age will give you number so you can use the type of somehow in combination with other things that I'm going to explain to you in order to get a property given its type but it's not that easy with what we had so far and it usually isn't really that useful even we don't we 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 usually don't need to say, hey, person, give me all of your number values or all of your numeric values. We just want to know the value of the property age, not, not because it's a, it has a type number. But yeah, we can do things. Uh, we can do them in a more complicated way because they are not that used. So JavaScript, the JavaScript language didn't want to sweat too much on uh, giving to you a feature that is not going to be used by many people. The important features that are used a lot by many people are instead made as easy as possible. Um, property names limitation? No limitations. You can do whatever you want and this is exactly what we've done before. You can uh, have keys that are called for, let, return because they are strings and you can access them with dot notation or square brackets notations and that's fine. About numbers, you can have keys which are numbers, but remember that any key you put here will still be a string. So it looks like a number, but this is actually the string zero. And you can get it from obj of string zero. Oh, I don't think you can get obj dot zero. Oh, wait a second. Um, let me try one thing. Ah, oh, come on, where am I? Let's try this thing. Const obj is equal to zero hello okay this is an object that contains one property called zero and the property value is is hello so I'm pretty sure that I can do obj of string zero yes I can do this remembering that zero is actually a string even though if it looks like a number uh, I cannot do obj of zero like this Yes, I can. <laughs> this is pretty strange. And, uh, oh, test, same property. Okay, yeah, it works like this too. And what happens if I say obj of zero in dot notation? Oh, no. Zeros are probably not uh, recognized, just like spaces and dashes in property numbers, in, in as property names, uh, so with dot notation. So if you are planning to use numbers, just use the square bracket notation with a string inside. Let's say that obj now has a new property called uh, one hello. This is not going to work because one hello ha starts with a number. And as you know, even variables cannot start with a number. You cannot say let one hello. This is not working. You can have numbers in any other place, and this works, but you cannot have them as starting a, a variable. So obj one hello doesn't work, but you can do obj hello one. And in this case, obj hello one can be retrieved in any kind of notation. Dot notation is fine, and also where bracket notation is fine. Okay, so numbers are strange. Remember that the zero uh, is actually a string. And if you do this, for some reason, the zero will be automatically converted into a string, weakly typed. Oh, you, you say it, it says it here. The number zero is converted to a string. That's why it works. It doesn't work because the zero is a number. It, it works because this notation expects a string and a number will be automatically converted into a string. Uh, I don't want to see this stuff. Do I want to see this stuff? Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. No, no, I don't want to. Yeah, you saw already this kind of uh, strange proto thing uh, that we didn't see. Um, don't mess with it. Don't assign a number to this proto, otherwise you are going to break your object. So, bottom line, don't mess up with proto. Just leave it like that. Sometimes proto could be useful. For example, obj, if I look at it, has two properties, but it also has a proto. And as a proto, it has lots of uh, methods, lots of functions, one of which is called, for example, toString. And we can try to do a toString. Obj.toString. It will give me a string, pretty useless one. It's giving me a string with a square brackets, object and object in uppercase. It's just telling me that this is an object. But this is not really that interesting. If I want to have a string that contains the value of this object, instead, I can rely on some other object that is already provided by the JavaScript language. This object is called, surprise, surprise, JSON. JSON is an object that allows me to perform operations on JavaScript objects. And the two operations that I can show you are called parse and stringify, which are exactly one of the opposite of the other, because parse takes a string and tries to convert it into a JavaScript object. And stringify instead takes a JavaScript object and turns it into a string. So we can try JSON dot stringify and pass as a parameter the object that we want to stringify. And this is going to give me this string here, which is exactly a representation, a string representation of the object that we wanted. We can even store this value inside of a, a variable like uh, const str is equal to JSON stringify. And now the str contains the string. And if I want to unwrap the string and have an object back, I can do JSON parse of this string. And now we've got the object. We could call this thing serialization and deserialization of objects because you've got an object which is a JavaScript construct and you want to turn it into a string because a string is a, can be a stream of text that you can send over the internet. You cannot send an object through the internet, but you serialize it, you turn it into uh, some value that can be passed, can flow through the interwebs, and then on the other side, they will deserialize the object, turning the string back into an object. So JSON parse and JSON stringify are pretty useful, especially when you deal with uh, more complex stuff. So far so good? Probably. So you see that object has a proto property which we should never mess up with. So just don't mess up with it. And that's it. Um, there is another thing that I don't think it's really that important nowadays. But if you want to check if the property contains... Uh, uh, sorry. If you want to check if an object contains a property, for example, how do I know if this object contains the property hello1? Well, I can say object.hello1 is uh, well is truthy i can probably convert it into a boolean oops and i know that hello1 exists uh, or else i can use this other keyword here which i never used in my life in given the string and the object the string containing the property name and the object. So you can say the string hello1, is it in obj? Yes, it is. Is the string, uh, I don't know, in object? No, the object doesn't have this kind of property. It has nothing to do with property types, as Bobby was asking. But still, it's uh, looking for property names in the object. 
But, you know, I never used this thing in my life and I'm not even sure it's, it's really that important. You can also have this, user dot not such property is equal to undefined because, well, if no such property doesn't exist in the, in the object, well, its value will be undefined. But also you can use this special operator and uh, never going to use it, <laughs> okay? Uh, so this is one of the things in, that I'm going to really skip. Another thing that we can, uh, we can almost skip is a new way to loop over things. Because you can loop over an object and you can loop with this special loop called for in. And again, I'm going to show you this. Not really that difficult, but nowadays I think that almost nobody uses the for in loop because there are other ways to iterate through objects which, uh, which we really like better. But still, I'm going to show you. So, let's say we've got a person, and I have declared a person on top. So, I'm giving for granted that the person exists. And in order to loop over the properties of the person, I can do something like this. For, for statement. But instead of having the three statements, the begin statement, the condition statement, and the step statement. We just have one statement here. We declare a variable that I usually call key in person, which means for every property key that I find in the person object, do something with that property key. For example, I can console log the key. <coughs> And what about the value? Well, now square brackets are really, really interesting and are really important. If I want to get the value, I can say const value is equal to person of the key, the current key. I don't know which key it is, but given the current key, just giving me the, 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 the value of the current key associated with the, with the current key. So console log the value. You see, bracket, square bracket notation, still relevant, still important nowadays. <clears throat> and that's it. You loop over objects by looping over the keys. And then you can do whatever you want with the key. You can print it or you can retrieve the value from the key by using the square bracket notation. And then you can do whatever you want with the value too. Another thing is that if I remember correctly, let can even become const. Pretty sure it, it, it does. Because for every single iteration in the loop, it's still going to create a new variable called key. It will never be the same. So I'm not saying that you should say use const instead of uh, let. Not necessarily. But you can. And there's nothing wrong with that. Hopefully. Let me see. I'll try it. So this is let person. Nope, because I've got property name, which I should comment out. Okay, let's try again. Person. Yep, got a person. And now I can try to loop over the keys by using the const here declaration instead of the let. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it works. There's a lot of stuff here. It printed name which is the key, the first key it found, and Matteo Anthony, which is the value of that key. Nickname and ice on fire, age and 38, likes yogurt and true, body and the objects associated to the body, speak and its function, and calculator and the math object. So it printed everything. Um, probably I could also print everything in the same line by taking advantage of the fact that console log accepts any kind any number of parameters and it will just print them separated by spaces so i can just make it a little more concise like this okay this is a little better name matteo anthony nickname ice on fire age 38 likes yogurt true body speak calculator nice and now bobby i'm not sure that i'm answering you but if you put an if here, maybe you can just retrieve only the properties of a certain type. 
For example, I'm going to do it in a separate uh, a separate for loop. If I say for const key in person, and then if type of person of key, so the type the type of the value that is stored in person of key is a number. Then I'm going to console log the key and the person key. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. Let's see what happens. Yep, I just see age 38. Mind that there are other numeric values here, but they are stored in inside of a sub object, which is of type object. So these are filtered out unless I get inside of the body object and then I will be able to also get these values, which is a good exercise that we can do right now. For example, if the person key is number, then do this. Otherwise, if the type is an object like this, whoops, well, in this case, I'm not looking at name or age. I'm looking at things like body. And body is an object itself. So I can go inside of body and do the same thing. I can uh, iterate, loop over the body keys. Let's call it body key. In uh, person of key, which is the body. And in that case, I can do the same. If uh, type of um, person of key of body key is equal to number and I'm messing up sorry I'm not going to oh, okay I'm, I'm going to slow down in a while let's see if, if, if this works and then I'll show you some things um, then lock the body key and also person of key of body key let's see what happens that's, that's a monster, and I would never write code like this, but let's see. Age 38, eyes is 2, nose is 1, mouth is 1, arms is 2, legs is 2. This code works. It's crap, but it works. And why does it work? Well, I would never write code like this. I would probably start splitting it into functions, and maybe a recursive function too, which you don't know what it is because I haven't explained it. But uh, what we are doing here is pretty interesting because if you have nested objects, if you have objects that contain other objects, then yes, person of key is the current value, but the value could be an object. And uh, we, can, we can even split it like this. If person key is an object, then we can call it body. Uh, it's probably not always a body, but in this case, it's a body. And we store the value of person key inside of this body. Now that we've got a body, every occurrence of person key can be just replaced with body. That's where why variables uh, are so awesome. You can store a calculation in a variable and then you reuse it anywhere. And then here we are redoing exactly the same loop that we were doing on the person, but we are doing it on the body. So we are looping over the keys of the body and whenever you see a value for the body, which is a number, then we print the key of the body and the value associated to that key. But before I created this variable, uh, we incurred in this kind of uh, situation here, which is unreadable, it's ugly, but it shows how you can iterate, uh, well, you can uh, n go deep in the properties of an object, even with square bracket notation, which is something that we didn't see before. So it, it's pretty stupid, but if I go on to get the legs of the person, I can say person.body.legs and it works. Or I can use square bracket notation, like person, give me the body and then give me the legs. Pretty strange looking, but it works. And I can even do combinations of stuff like person dot body person square body uh, dot legs or person dot body square legs. Okay, it they are two completely equal alternatives, so you can mess them up as you want. 
So, yeah, to reply to your question, Bobby, I don't know if this is what you wanted or if you would just want to, yeah, if you want to pick only the numbers, then you could put all this in a function and uh, it, the function will be function give me properties of type and you can even have the type being a parameter. Okay, instead of give me, let's call it get. Get properties of type type. And whenever you incur in a property of that type, you can just place it there. But if the person has a body, and the body has another property, which in turn is another object, and you have to go deeper and deeper, this means that you have to build another for loop inside of this for loop to inspect the properties of that sub-sub property which makes it unfeasible. You don't want to loop forever. Um, you don't want to write infinite loops. You cannot write infinite loops. That's why in such cases, we have to uh, resort to the recursion. A recursion means invoking this, the, a function from itself, a function that calls itself and uh, it can lead to infinite loops. Uh, we already mentioned this uh, some time ago. We can incur in a stack overflow, which is the name of the main website in which you can find problems and solutions to your coding exercises. So yeah, we can use recursion, but this is a more advanced topic that I don't want to do right now because I think that this is already pretty confusing for you right now uh, since you just started working with objects. So let's do exercises and objects. Let's do simple exercises and objects. And maybe one day, if we are brave enough, we can go to more complex stuff like this one. So don't worry if you didn't get this last part, really. So we can loop over objects in multiple ways, but this is one way. This is object specific. Objects can be looped this way. Um, yeah, what about the order? Well, there is an order in objects, and the order is usually alphabetical, if I think so, if, if, I, if I remember correctly. But, uh, well, the, the bottom line is never rely on ordering of projects, uh, of objects, because if you add a new property, you don't have the assurance that that object, that, that property will be in the same order in which you expect. Maybe it will be added as the last element. Question on Discord for, uh, by Angelo. In this example, what does the value do? Because it seems like in the console, the properties are only console logged once. Hmm. Wait a second, I don't think I understood this. In this example, what does the value do? Because it seems like in the console, the properties are only consult log once. Yes, they should be consult log once, but for every single property, you should see the key of the property, like name, and the value of the property, like Angelo. So they are. Every key is iterated just once, but for every key, you print both the key and the value of the property. I don't know if that's the, the, the doubt that you have. Oh, sorry, I was confused, sure, okay, okay, awesome. Good, so let's not rely too much on orders, um, on the order of properties in an object. If you want to have ordered things, maybe you want to rely on arrays, which is the next topic that we will cover after we finish the topic on objects. So yeah, who cares about that? Uh, blah, 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 summary. And that's it for the basics of objects. And this was the easy part, but then there's a hard part. And unfortunately we have one hour left. So we will go with the hard part now. I'll try to make it as simple as possible, but this is one of those things that happen this is one of these small obstacles that you have in every programming languages in every programming class so watch out i al always told you that when you um you know what i'm going to create a new a new file here zero two uh let's call it references 
how's it called here object references and copy okay so references I always told you that if you um, if you create a function like sum and it has a and b and you return a and b uh, a plus b of course um, you can also transform these a and b parameters you can change them as you like so for example this function could be called increment and sum given a and b and you can say a plus plus b plus plus which increments both variables and then returns their sum if i use this function let's use it increment and sum of two and three i expect increment and sum not to give me five but to give me seven because two was increased to three three was increased to four and three plus four is seven but the important part is not this one the important part is that if I instead use variables like let x is equal to 1 uh, to 2 and let y is equal to 3 and I use those variables and pass those variables into the function, the most important part of all this thing is that these variables are copied to these parameters and even if these parameters change their value, the original value of the variables that were passed to this function do not change. So if I console log, oh, come on. if I console log x and y here, I will see 2 and 3. If I console log increment and sum, I will have 7 because the parameters a and b were incremented and summed and the result is 7 but if I now do another console log of x and y they are still 2 and 3 because their values were just copied into the function they were not passed as a reference they were passed as a value as a copy and this is good because this way we can do whatever we want with these internal parameters and rest assured that the outer variables will never be affected. Just to recap, if I now try to console log instead A and B, this will give you an error because A and B were never declared outside of the scope of increment and sum increment and sum has two parameters a and b and just like local variables these two parameters only live inside of the scope of this function so you cannot refer to those variables from outside but you know this because we did two or three lessons about functions right so nothing new here now this thing about passing the value which is copied does not really apply with objects it's slightly different so for example let's create a function called set name to an object given the name so this is a function that takes an object and it sets the name property to the object how can it do it pretty easy i can ask the object to specify as, the, as a name the name that I have been passed as a property and then I return the object as it is so I'm changing the parameter here I'm changing the object by assigning a new value for the property name or maybe the object didn't even have the property name so it will be added and then I return the object that is now that should have the name now okay not really that difficult so far let's create these two parameters so I can create a const let let's let's start with let first let person is equal to an object that can be empty or can have anything let, let's put my age but it can also have a name the name will be overridden as you know it's fine this is the person and I want to also declare the variable name uh, 
I don't want it to be called exactly like this one. So I'm going to call it uh, first name. And my first name is, unfortunately, Matteo Anthony. This is just so some of you remember my name. I saw some of you in the early uh, days of these lessons call me teacher, maybe for as a form of respect or maybe because you didn't remember my name. Uh, you are not supposed to respect me. <laughs> you, you, well, respect me the, the, the right amount uh, as, a, as, a, as a pair, as, as a peer, not as a, as a teacher. So just call me by my name or any of my nicknames or however you prefer, but not out of, as a form of respect. I'm your brother, I'm your friend, not your teacher. Okay, so let's see what happens if I console log the person. General Kenobi! Yeah, that could be good as a, as a name. <laughs> Hello there. Console log person will probably print... Well, it doesn't print very much, because if you, if you remember, it will print object, object, which is not that useful. So we can try to use instead what I already taught you a while ago. Console log JSON stringify of person and this will probably print something more useful it will print something like uh, the object containing I expect age and the number 38 something like that hmm? but then I call set name given the person and the first name those two parameters that I, uh, those two variables that I declare here on top. And if I try to console log it, uh, set name still returns an object. So when I console log the object, it will still give me object object, which is not exactly what we want. Uh, we can maybe store the results in some other variable like a const uh, new person. Okay. And then we can console log the stringified version. I'm going pretty fast, so I'm going to slow down. Do you understand what I'm doing? I'm trying to do exactly the same stuff that I was doing before, but instead of using numbers, I'm using objects as parameters. Actually, one object and one string. So I'm declaring an object and I'm declaring a string. I'm inspecting the value of the object. I'm not inspecting the value of the string because I don't really care about it. I'm not even changing the string. But if you want, I can console log the first name too and see that it doesn't change at all. Uh, but it's not really that useful. I'm interested in this object right now. The person is printed and it gives me age is equal to 38. We will check it later on. Then I invoke the function set name, which is supposed to get one object and a name, and I'm passing these two variables, person and first name. And since the function returns an object, uh, the, the modified object, I'm going to store the, res the result in uh, its own variable. And now I can do I can do some inspections. I can see what is the console log of stringifying this new person and see what its, what its new value is. I can console log what is the value of the previous person, so another JSON stringify of person, to check if they are equal or if they, or if they changed. And for now I could stop here. Shall we try this code or do you want to have just 30 seconds to, to catch up? I'll take myself 30 seconds to grab a bottle. Yeah, maybe I mean to understand the concepts. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Um, we are concoctioning an experiment here. The experiment is trying to prove or disprove 
that when objects are passed as parameters into a function, they will behave differently from other kinds of values that we saw so far. So for example, if we pass numbers, we already saw that the numbers are copied in these parameters a and b, and even if I change the value of these parameters, the original values ooh, are left unaffected. They were 2 and 3 before, and after I executed, I invoked the function, those two variables remained unchanged. Whereas the parameters inside of the function were changed, actually. And in fact, we've got 7 as a result, not 5. In this case, we are going to inspect what happens if one of these two parameters is actually an object. The object is an object of age 38, and the first name is whatever you want. You, we now print the person, and we see that it's actually age 38. But then we create a new reference to an object, new person, which is the result of performing this function. This function takes the object, takes the name, sets the property name to the object, and then returns the changed object. And after this, when I print these two objects, new person and the old person, what do you expect? Do you expect the old person to be age 38 and the new person to be age 38, but also name is equal Matteo Anthony? Well, this first thing, yeah, I expect it to be like this. Hopefully, if this function works, new person will have age 38 because nobody changed this, uh, this property, but it will also have name is equal to Matteo Anthony, which will probably be an, uh, with a double quote, like this. It will be like this because if the function does its work, then probably uh, the object was affected by adding a new property, Matteo Anthony. But now, the real question is, what happened to the old person? Dun, dun, dun. Let's find out. I'm going to copy all this stuff and I'm going to paste it on the developer tools. Drum roll, please. So, the first console log was actually pretty nice and it printed age 38, which means that I shouldn't probably bother with the JSON stringify. <laughs> I could have probably just console log the person and that's it. But now we've got strings, which is fine too. It, they are easily inspectable. When uh, after be doing the set name, the new person is what we expect. It has age 38 and name my name. But the JSON stringify of person, the old one, changed the value of the object. What? So apparently the objects, objects do not behave in a similar way to other primitive types, as we call them. Primitive types like two, three, a string or a, a Boolean value, they are passed as value, which means that they are copied in the parameters but objects are passed as reference and in fact if i create a const object which is equal to this empty object here and i create a new object which is equal to object unlike primitive values i'm not creating a new object i'm actually only creating a new reference to the same object. What does it mean? Well, if you think of references as labels or for the low level guys, pointers, addresses where something is stored, then obj is, as a variable, is not an object, is a reference to an object. And when I create a new variable, this is just a new label that I give to the same object. These are exactly the same object. I can even say, is obj equal strictly to new obj? It probably is. Let's find out. Const obj is equal to 
an empty object. const new obj is equal to obj itself. Is new obj exactly the same as obj? Yes, it is, because they are not two different objects. They are two labels that are attached to the same object. They are two references to the same object. Instead, if I do const obj2, which is equal to an empty object, well, obj2 looks a lot like obj, obj because they, they are two empty objects. But now these two are references to different objects that look the same, they look the same, but they are not exactly the same. Obj and Obj2 are twins. They are two objects that exactly look the same, but they are two distinct things. Instead, Obj and New Obj are just two names that you give to the same object. It's like the name of the and the nickname to the same object. It's like calling me Matteo Anthony or Matteo and, or Anthony, but you're still referring to the same person. Okay? This is the difficult to understand concept about objects. There are other difficult to understand concepts. We'll probably see them uh, later or the next Saturday. But this is the really, really difficult thing. An object as a, as a folder, as a, as a container, contains properties, and when you create references to objects, you're actually creating reference to the same object, unlike, unlike the um, primitive values. For example, if you create let message is equal to the string hello, and then, you uh, and then you create let phrase is equal to message, well, phrase is a variable that contains a new string, which is the copy of the previous one, but they are two completely different boxes. With primitive values, it is like this. With numbers, with strings, with booleans, it is like this. But with objects, it's different. Because the object is a cabinet. And when you... And the, and the, and the object has... You see, uh, well, it, it uses a, a mail. Uh, it uses a, a reference, a label that contains... Uh, to an object that contains other things. So, when we create user, which is an, an object that contains stuff, and admin is equal to user, we're actually creating two addresses, two references, two labels that, refers, that refer to the same cabinet. And this is somehow confusing, maybe, but it's also really, really useful. Uh, we will see some examples why this is useful. And here we are doing exactly the same thing that we were doing in the console. So if we create an object and then you create a new variable, which is a reference to the same object, you see, there is something that is copied, but what is copied is not the object itself. It's the reference to the object. It's the pointer, it's the address of the object, not the whole object. So if you check if A and B are equal, they are, and they are also strictly equal because they are a reference to the exact same object. They are just nicknames to the same object. But if instead you create two variables which hold as a value two different objects which has the same shape, but they are two different objects, they are siblings, uh, they are not siblings, uh, they are twins, sorry. They are twins, and they are not the same person. So A will not be equal to B, not, not strictly and not even non-strictly. They are not the same thing. They are two completely different things, even if they look alike. Please don't confuse twins as one person. Okay? Uh, cloning and merging is not what uh, something that I want to do right now. Probably it's uh, way too complicated. When you, know, when you understand this, you can understand also what happened when dealing with functions now. Because when I passed this object as a parameter to the function, what was copied in the function was not the object itself. It was just a reference to the same object. So when I changed the object here, I just changed, uh, I changed the same object that I passed 
because the only thing that was copied is ju was just a reference. And that's why these two, new person and person, are actually going to be exactly the same value because they are equivalent. They are exactly the same object. Uh, if you want to have a graphical representation, I put it this morning on the slides and I love this kind of animation here. Passing by reference and passing by value. Ooh, wait a second. Angelo, sorry, it was a bit fast for me, but if I understood correctly, the outcome of the experiment is that person was changed through the reference of new person, which is not what happened in the normal function example with X and Y before. So objects behave differently here. Yes, they do. Exactly. Because when you pass an object, when you pass, let's see it with this animation here. When you pass a cup as a primitive value, as a number, as a string, and you, um, and you pass it to a function like fill cup, then that primitive value will be copied in the parameter. And when you fill the cup, you will see that the original cup was not affected. But instead, with objects, the objects are passed by reference. And if you pass an object to fill cup, when you fill the cup inside of the function, also the original object will be filled. Also the original cup will be filled because we are copying not the, not the object, but a reference to the object. Okay? Pretty difficult to understand, but really, really important, especially if you plan to learn React as a framework and to get the most of its performance. I, I know that this is really big, but you have a whole week to understand it, to do exercises, and also to ask me anything while you're studying. If there's still something that you don't get, or you want an example, or you want to do experiments with me, just reach me on Discord privately, or even better, publicly. Because if you have any problems and you expose them publicly, nobody will make fun of you. Uh, probably the, the others too have are struggling the same way and whatever you say whatever you ask is really really useful to everybody else so feel free to pose your question your dubs your memes whatever in a public channel uh, in the schools uh, section you can put it in javascript since we're doing it in javascript or you can do it in generals too if you want to um if you do it privately, I can reply to you privately, but you're hiding some good, important information to everybody else. So please don't do this. Uh, unless you are, of course, uh, may maybe showing me the solution to an exercise and the exercise you don't want to spoil the solution of that exercise to someone else. Of course, that's another reason why you should uh, message me privately. Um, Another simple thing about objects, so don't worry about that. Let's go back to objects. There is a new syntax with objects that allows you to do this thing here. So we saw that uh, an object can have, um, can have functions as uh, property values. And here we use the function expression syntax to pass a function to this, as a speak value. Uh, we also added somewhere the arrow function, which is good. It's even more concise for uh, one-liners. Another new part of the syntax, however, is that we can do it like this. We can remove function and we can remove the columns. And it looks like this. This is the way we, another way we can, uh, we can define methods of an object. And this is a syntax specific to objects. All the objects can have this kind of syntax. You don't need to say function. You don't need to say function after it. You even, don't even need to do the arrow function. You can just say speak, open close parentheses, and then curly braces. And this is seen as a method. So a function belonging to an object. Okay, pretty little thing so what should we use should we use this one or should we use the arrow function which is more concise 
or the error express uh, the function expression it depends it depends a lot so can you add an iife to an object Ooh, that's a cool question can i add an iife to an object let's try yes you can but mind that it has a different meaning to just passing a reference to a function but yes so we can create a const object with computed values this is an object which will have computed values for example i can say that my age is equal to uh, I have to do some calculations here before calculating my age. Maybe I have to get the current year. Maybe I have to get the year when I was born. I have to do sub the subtraction and only the result will be my age. So I want to use a function here that will do this calculation. So for example, uh, let current year is equal to 2021. Let year of birth is equal year of birth year of birth is equal to 1982 and let age is equal to the current year minus the year of birth and this should probably give me 38 or 39 <laughs> i don't know 39 probably but i'm still 38 because i will do my I will I will have my birthday in October, but still uh, I don't care about that. And then I can return my age. This is not an immediately invoked function. This is a function. So to this object with computed values, I can ask, "Hey, object with computed values, give me the age as a function." But maybe I don't want to call it as a function. Maybe I want to calculate it just once, and then use the result as a property hey give me the age like it is right now if i do, if i don't put the parentheses then age is just a reference to this function which is not really that useful but if i want to have the age computed and then returned as a value to the age i can do it in two ways one way is to not use and a function expression i can uh, declare this function elsewhere uh, compute age and here i can say compute age invoked this will be immediately invoked so i'm uh, invoking compute age this will make its calculations the calculation will probably give me 38 or 39 and the 38 or 39 will be stored as the property age. Age is not a function. Age is a number, which is the result of this calculation. But if you don't want to have a function stored elsewhere with a name that I have to refer to, then yes, if you want, if you really want, you can just use an IIFE, which means exactly taking that function replacing it as the name of the function, wrapping it in parentheses, and executing it right away. What advantage do I have here? Well, no real advantage. The only advantage is that I am doing this calculation with variables that only live in the scope of this function. So the current year, if I console log the current year, this will not be available because the current year was created inside of this function. It was born, it was used, and it died inside of this function. Which happens exactly the same if I declare a function outside. So the only advantage here is to avoid giving a name to this function. That's the only advantage that I see here. But modularity is already achieved with uh, functions. And if I declare a function here called compute age, oh come on, not fancy tone, function, compute age and this function has exactly the same body as this one well these variables are still local to the compute age function so there's no real need to use an iife here the only 
yeah, the only reason I want to do it is to perform some calculations in place without giving a name to this function. Who cares about that? Um, something else that I wanted to tell you about? No, maybe we can continue with um, simple stuff. Don't worry. Cloning and merging an object sign. So, let's go back to references. We understood that if we have created one object called obj and we create a new reference to the same object, these are two different references but to the same object. They are nicknames to the same person. So, this is not copying an object, cloning an object. If you do let a is equal 1 and let b is equal a, then b, uh, then b is equal a, then b will be a copy of the number 1 and they will live independently. But with objects, it's different. They are not the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> which is kind of strange. In fact, the equals symbol <clears throat> has a slightly different meaning in this case. Because if I say, is A equal to B? Yes, they are in number world, because those two variables hold the same value. A is 1 and B is also 1. They are not the same variable. They are two different variables, but the value is the same. In, with objects, the equal symbol uh, looks slightly different, because equals doesn't mean they have the same value. It means that they store, they reference, they point to the same resource, to the same object. So, let's do it with some comments. Here, with primitive values, primitive values, I don't know if you hear it, but my stomach is gurgling right now. Maybe because we are close to lunchtime. I'm sorry if you, see, if you hear this. Uh, as you can see, I'm very human. <laughs> Uh, primitive values, so we've got A and B, and if we check if A is equal to B, uh, we, console, we can console log this, of course, if we want to. Console log. Uh, we will see that the two values are equal, okay? With primitive values, it's pretty straightforward. But now we've got objects. And with objects, this holds true but not because the two values are equals uh, are equal, but because the two references point to the same object, which is completely different. In fact, if I create now object one, which is equal to this, and object two, which is equal to something very, very similar, but they are not the same object, they are twins, you will see that object one is different from object 2 because in this case all oh, the two with the oh, this because in this case the two references point to two different objects shaped equally but they are two different objects That's another thing that I wanted to show you. What happens when we say that person is const instead of using let? Uh, this can become const because I'm never changing first name. So when I'm declaring the person and the first name and then I'm uh, using them to, uh, as parameters in the set name function, I am changing the object somehow because I am uh, uh, storing a new property in the object. But will this work even if the person is a constant? Let's find out. I'm going to copy all this. Uh, you know what? I'm going to remove this stringify, which is uh, proved to be not really that useful. It just makes the code a little more verbose and I want to make it as simple as possible, okay? You can keep it, you can remove it, it's exactly the same. So let's recap, okay, I'll recap it in the, in the developer tools. Okay, so I've got, oh come on, I've got a person 
which is now a constant. Oh, come on, this subs daily. I think I have to go to another website that doesn't bother me with wet sockets. So I'm good to the Inglorious Coded website, why not? Hey, my website. Okay, here we should be safe from uh, stupid web worker stuff. So, const person age 38. Now this person is a constant. So we would be led to think that this object cannot change, it cannot mutate. But here we are going to mutate the object. In fact, we are going to assign a new property called name. So will this break? Let's see. No, it doesn't break. It behaves exactly the same as before. And why is that? Well, because when we declare const person, we are not saying that the object person cannot be changed. We are just saying that the reference to the object cannot be changed. So this means that if I have a let, uh, let obj1 is equal to an object, I can say in a second moment that object one is now a number, the number one. You see the difference? I don't, I'm not changing the object, I'm changing the reference to the object. Obj one was referring to an object, but now it doesn't refer to the object anymore, it's referring to something else, it's referring to the number one. And I can change this reference because the variable is a variable, is let. But if I say const, obj2 then I'm declaring a reference to an object and the reference cannot be changed so I cannot say obj2 is now a number or is another object I cannot do this because the variable is constant so you see the slight difference with numbers being constant means that you cannot change its value and that's it with, uh, let's say, constants. If I say const a is equal to one, I now cannot use a because it was declared here. Let's say x. Const x is, oh, not even x. No, I got x. Um, variable, come on, oh, number. Const number is equal to one. Once I have this number, I cannot say number is equal to a string or any other number. I cannot because I cannot reassign a value to this number. So the number must be kept one and it will never change over time. But with objects it's slightly different. Uh, const obj. My constant object cannot be reassigned to anything else. So const obj cannot be a string. Which makes sense, because it's exactly the same behavior that we have with primitive values. But this does not mean that I cannot change the object. In fact, I can say, hey const obj, hey reference to that object, put a name inside of it. And you can, because you're not changing the reference to the object. You're changing the object, but not the reference. Okay, so the, the, the very difficult part in here is to try to split in your mind these two concepts. There's things, variables, values in the world of JavaScript and in programming in general. And then there are references to those values. And now that we're thinking in objects, the distinction between references and their actual values is really, really important. And you have to understand it really well. It makes a lot more sense. So, if you cannot create a clone, if you cannot copy an object by just assigning uh, the same object to a new variable, how can you clone? Uh, is this part of a new... Yeah, this is a part of a new topic, however. So I'm going to say 03 clone, cloning. So, we have an object, object 1, which is an empty object, or any object that you, that you want. You can also have it non-empty, of course. Um, if you do const obj2, which is obj1, this is not a clone. And I'm going to say it here. 
not a clone we are creating a new reference to the same object okay new nickname for the same object if i have something like const obj1 and now it's going to give me errors but i don't care about it and then const obj2 which is another object like this this is still not a clone they are uh, similar objects but created in two different ways even if they have properties like uh, name Anthony this has name Anthony this has name Anthony they are still no clones they are two distinct objects created in two different ways could we go a little slower yes See, yes okay so um, I'm actually probably I'm going fast here because I was pretty much copying the same stuff that I did in this file but uh, yes of course if you want to rewrite exactly what I'm doing I can slow down uh, I'm going to just make name here too just to uh, stop dealing with the just empty object um, I'm going to rehearse it again giving you the time to 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 to, to, to catch up with the coding so I created an object, any kind of object, and I created a new variable, which is a reference to the, to the previous object. This is not cloning. We are just creating a new reference to the same object. I'm going to remove this side panel. Okay. We are just creating a new reference to the same object. This have creating two objects, which I have exactly the same shape is not cloning. They are similar objects, but they are not clones. If I want to create a function that clones an object into another object, I have to, well, pay some extra effort. Cloning is not that easy. Well, it is actually, but I will show you uh, first the difficult, the difficult way and then the, the easy way. Okay, so let's create a function called clone that given an object will do something as you see i'm always using the word obj instead of object because i'm afraid that object could be a, a a reserved keyword maybe not we can try let object is equal to one no it works so i can also say clone object and that's fine okay function clone which will take an object and will return a new object which is the exact copy of the previous one how can we do it we cannot do it like this we cannot just say const new object const clone is equal to this one what we can do instead is we can create a new object maybe an empty one so const cloned object which is not cloned it's just an empty object and then one by one we can copy all the properties of the previous object into this new object that's it how can we do this one by one well we can use the for in loop which we just discovered so in the function clone given the object I start with an empty object and then I start looping over all the keys inside of the object of the object to be cloned and for every key that i find i can place a new property in the cloned object with the value associated to that key so i can say it for example like this uh, cloned object of key square bracket notation without string quotes because i don't know what is the key whatever key we have right now will be equal to object of key so i take the value from the previous object given the key and i place it as the value of the clone object given the same key At the end of this, I need to just return the cloned object, hoping that 
this code works. This code looks a lot like the other kinds of loops that we've done so far. For example, when you have a sum that starts with zero and then you increment the sum and finally you return the value, the final value of the sum. Or uh, you start with an empty string and then you concatenate new things to the string and then you return the, con the, the lastly concatenated string. And here we're doing the same. We're starting with an empty object. We are modifying the object more and more, the more keys we find. And finally, we return the final object. So as you can see, a lot of recipes that we saw so far are actually pretty applicable to any other topic, even with objects. The neutral element in numbers is zero. When you go with a sum, you start with zero. But for example, if you start with a multiplication, then the neutral number will be one, as we saw. With strings, the neutral number is the empty string. We, we start with an empty string and then we increment it. We, we concatenate more and more. With objects, the neutral element is the empty object. And here, for every key that we find in the previous object, we just increase the current object by passing more and more stuff. Shall we try this uh, function? Is everybody there? Do you need more time? I usually try to explain things more thoroughly while people are catching up with the code, but I'm probably not saying anything new. Yes, we can try it. I'm good. Awesome. Okay, so we can create a new object, const object to clone and my object will have uh, I ran out of fantasy name Anthony age 38 and hungry true this is my object to clone and then I can create another constant here called uh, cloned object I know that it looks exactly the same variable that we see here, but as you know, it's completely different. This is a local variable that was born, used, and died in the scope of the function. And this is a completely different variable that has nothing to do with this inner variable. Cloned object is the result of cloning the current object. And then two things we can try. We can check if the two objects look the same. So, for example, I can console log the object to clone and also the cloned object, just to check visually if they look the same. And then I can also console log the results of checking if we are not actually referring to the same object because we want a clone, so a completely different object that has the same shape, not the same object, not the two reference to the same object. So another thing that we can do is to check if the object to clone is equal to the cloned object. This should be false. I hope that this is false, because if this is false, because if this is false, yeah, um, we have two variables, two reference to two different objects which have the same shape, but they are clones. They are twins. They are not the same object. And this is the purpose of cloning an object. I want two objects which are two different things, but have the same value. Shall we try? I'm going to copy all this. Well, function and the execution of the function. And I'm going here, refreshing everything. And I'm going to try this thing here. One, two, three, go. Oh, object is not defined. <laughs> okay. Uh, what did I do? What did I do? Okay, yeah, I had to say clone object to clone. Sorry. <laughs> Pretty bad mistake. Okay, let's try again. Three, two, one. Okay, now it worked. The objects look pretty much the same. So good. But this thing says false. So it's not the same objects. It's actually two different objects. One is the clone of the other. Yay. 
It's not over yet, however. Uh, the cloning function is a good exercise and I encourage you to try it by yourself as a homework. Try to re-come up with a clone function. But nowadays, modern JavaScript has other ways we can clone objects. There is one function here, one method of the object object, which is called assign. And uh, this makes everything much easier. So how does it work? So for, first of all, we've got a special object in JavaScript, which we haven't covered yet. The special object is called object. And if I look at object, oh, it's not actually an object, it's a function. But nonetheless, object has properties. And these properties are a lot. <laughs> this, is, this can seem quite strange, and we will see it later on, but anything actually, if it's not a primitive value, anything can have properties, even functions. A function is a special kind of object, and you can assign properties to a function. Not really recommended, but sometimes it can be useful. So object is a function, but as an object, it also has properties, and one of these properties is called assign. Assign is um, a method of the object, object that accepts at least two parameters. The first one is the target, which means it's the object in which you want to copy, assign all the properties of the source. And the second parameter is the source, the object that you want to clone. So when you want to clone an uh, object to clone, it is pretty easy. Um, but I'm going to do it from scratch. <laughs> Sorry. So let's declare the object cl to clone. I'm going to copy it from here. Okay, now we've got the object to clone. And then we want the, well, the destination, the object in which we want to clone all the properties. So I will call it cloned object as always. But this time the cloned object is start with an empty, an empty object in which I will fill all the properties that I copied from the object to clone. And now I can use object assign by giving it the two parameters. And watch out, because the order is important. You have to first select the destination and then the source. It could be strange, not very familiar, but there is a good reason for that. So we have to do cloned object as the first one and then object to clone as the source. Why should we put first the target and then the source? Because as you can see here, the signature of this function, so the way we can use this function, is to provide a target and a source, or you can provide a target and multiple sources. All the sources that you pass will merge together in the targets. And since you can have any number of sources, it is much better to have them as the second parameter. So you can start with the target, which is just one, and then all the sources listed later. So object assign cloned object, object to clone. This will do two things. The first thing is it will return the cloned object. But the second thing is it will change the clone object. So this is a method of, of, the, of the object's object that actually changes the input. And we know that it changes the input. In fact, we already saw that if you pass an object to a function, it will be passed by reference, so it, it could be changed. So let's go with object assign. Bam! This is the returned object, which, sorry, I could even store it in a variable. Um, let's call it clone. Okay. And now I can check that the clone has this shape. The cloned object has this shape. 
The clone is actually the same reference to the cloned object because I told you object assign returns the cloned object and also modifies the cloned object. So the, the object that is returned by this function is the same object that I'm passing as target. But the important part is that the clone is not the object to clone. The object to clone was left untouched. And of course, the same goes with the cloned object, which is not the same as object to clone, because they are completely different. Okay? Too many things, too many objects, but uh, hopefully this will make sense if you study the material, and if you do exercises, and if you interact some more with me in the chat uh, for any problems that you have. Okay? Remember, you have to do a, some work by, on your side. There's no use to just learn coding by just watching a live stream. Uh, it's not enough. You have to practice, practice, practice. Uh, you know that I'm playing, you know that I play instruments. I play guitar, for example, and I will never learn to play guitar by just watching YouTube streams. Uh, I have to practice. And I recently learned how to play the Tetris theme. It was pretty hard. But after a few weeks, I'm starting to get the hang of it. By the way, does it also work if you define the const not as an object, but just as a const? Not really sure I understand you. Um, if you define the const not as an object, but just as a const. Uh, so you're saying object assign used with uh, variables, with numbers, for example. Um, not really sure. I mean, if you define cloned object as an empty const instead of an empty object. Oh, okay, I see. So, okay, yeah, okay. That's a, that, uh, of course, as always. Yours are always good questions. Um, so you're saying, let's create the object to clone, and let's create the cloned object starting not as an empty object, but as nothing or as undefined or as null so something that doesn't exist can i clone the object to clone inside something that doesn't even exist which is not initialized as an empty object let's try with null for example i'm going to re-execute this thing here and no because you cannot convert undefined or null to an object you have to start with an empty object otherwise it won't work in fact the way I usually create a clone of my object is usually doing something like this. Object, object dot clone, starting from an empty object, which I don't even want to name, object to clone. This can be stored inside of a variable. For example, can I say my new clone? Nope, uh, I said object clone, I'm sorry. Object assign. And my new clone has already been declared. Okay, I'm messing up. You, this stream is becoming Hunger Games, meaning that I'm hungry. So, object to clone. I have the object to clone, and now I'm going to create a clone by just passing an anonymous, anonymous empty object. I don't need to declare a variable or a constant holding the empty object. This is still the object that is going to be changed and returned. So I don't need to give it a name. And this is how I usually create clones. I object assign, starting from an empty object, the object to clone. And this is going to work. My new clone is a new object, which is completely different from the object to clone. And it's actually exactly the same as this object here, but I cannot refer to this object because I didn't store it in a variable. But I don't care. It's just my new clone. Okay? So, yeah, you have to pass an empty object. You cannot pass anything else. You cannot pass undefined null or a number, or whatever. Um, and then, as I said, you can also add multiple sources. And this way you will merge things together. In fact, you can try to create a, a recipe for a cake. You can create a cake by assigning to this empty object some uh, other properties that come from the, I don't know, from, 
from the flower, some properties that come from the eggs, some properties that come from uh, the milk, etc., etc. So something like const recipe, oop, const, ah, const recipe is equal to objects assign. You see that I'm using food, food examples. The more we go towards the towards lunchtime, well, we we were over lunchtime right now. Uh, object assign eggs. I don't know six eggs. Too many. I don't know. I don't know how to cook actually. Uh, milk. Let's say one liter, and uh, flour. Let's say 0 0.5 kilograms of flour. So as you can see, with object assign, the destination is empty. And we are going to merge all this stuff into the destination. If for any reasons there are some uh, names that are repl replicated, well, the last object that is going to be merged will win over the, over the most ancient one. So if I have x6 and x2, the object will contain x6 then it will contain x6 and milk 1, merging this one, and then it will contain flower 0 0.5, milk 1, and x will be overridden with 2. Let's see. Recipe is... Yeah, we've got two eggs instead of six. So anything that wasn't there will be added. Anything that was already there will be replaced. And that's it for today. There's already a lot that we have done. We didn't talk about nested cloning, maybe that's too much, we will see it next time. And uh, see you next Wednesday for our practice session. We will do all the exercise, all the tasks that we see in these uh, tutorials and we'll come up with other exercises. If you have any doubts, please feel free to ask me. Great lesson, thanks a lot, see you on Wednesday. And um, let me go here, in which I can wish you, as always, a good Weekend. Thank you very much. We have a lot to study. We have a nice lunch. Yeah, you've got a, mo a lot of to a lot more to study right now. But still, if you eat pasta, you will be able to cook faster. So for now, bye.